When I was around 10, I moved to London and started a new school. I felt alienated for the first few weeks and had no friends. On my walk to school, there was a paving stone somebody had spilt paint on. The shape created by the paint looked like the face of the devil. Two horns, teeth, etc. I avoided stepping on the stone and would walk around it every day. One day, I thought, fuck it, and I stepped on this face. I can't explain what I felt like when I stepped on it, but the word powerful would be close description. So every day, I started stepping on the face on my walk to school and would sometimes stand on it for a few seconds and absorb some power. Then one day, I thought, hey, this devil guy is kind of cool. Maybe I'll pledge allegiance to it. So I stood on the stone for a few seconds and swore a kind of oath. Give me friendship and popularity, etc., and I'll be a follower. Over the next few weeks, I made friends and became popular. I kept up my morning ritual of stepping on this face for a few weeks, but eventually just forgot about it. Obviously, I didn't grow up to be a devil worshipper or anything. I've broken the oath that I pledged. Skip to 2022. The last 10 years of my life have been a living hell. Both parents died. Three businesses failed. Several relationships in ruins. Best friend died. I could go on, but you get the point. None of the bad things have been my fault. They just happen. Shit seems to fall apart around me despite my best efforts and intentions. Pretty sure I'm cursed. I was 12 years old at the time this happened. It was the summer of 1984 and I was out of school for the season. And this particular day, my mom had to go out. She told me that she'd be back in about half an hour and she left. After a few minutes, I realized I had to spend some time in the bathroom. I went to use the normal upstairs bathroom, but I realized at that moment that I had left my Archie comic in the downstairs bathroom. I deeply disliked the basement and I seriously disliked the downstairs bathroom but sometimes it was necessary to use it if someone else was in the other one. I decided that I would just run down to grab my comic and head back upstairs to do my business. I headed down the stairs on the run, but by the time I reached the bathroom, I realized that the need to go was so urgent that I had no time to make it back up the stairs. So I sat down in the bathroom after locking the door and made the best of it. Now this bathroom was small, and I do mean very small. When I sat on the toilet, the corner of the sink sat just above my left knee. If I stretched my arm out in front of me, I could touch the other side of the room where the shower stall curtain was. Directly to the right of me was the door, and I could easily touch the doorknob and the lock above the handle. The lock consisted of nothing more than a hook and eye deal, and wouldn't stand up to anyone pulling on it hard, as it would simply come out of the wall. But it was enough that if someone tried the door, it would give reasonable resistance, and then they would realise that the bathroom was already in use. Simple enough, and generally sufficient for what it was needed for. So when I went into the bathroom, even though no one was home at the time, I shut the door and slipped the metal hook into the eye, and thought nothing of it at the time. I quickly got lost in the world of Archie Andrews, and the gang of characters that went to Riverdale High, until I heard a noise above me. I knew no one was home, but perhaps someone had come home while I was downstairs. I stopped reading and was listening intently when I heard the first heavy footsteps on the basement stairs. It was unusually loud and sounded like whomever it belonged to was very large and very, very heavy. I knew how many stairs there were, so as the heavy thudding on the stairs came slowly and deliberately closer, I counted. One, two... 8, 9, 14, 16. I thought I was scared by the time it reached the third stair, but by the time it had reached the tenth stair, I could actually hear it and, and took my breath away. As it descended, the sound of rushing air and demonic laughter came floating down the stairs in the hallway, through the bathroom door and into my very soul. I could hear it round the corner as it came to the bottom of the stairs and down the hallway towards me. I dropped the Archie book on the floor in a panic and grabbed the door handle as I realized it was now outside the bathroom door. 
I could hear the rushing wind and demonic laughter and a thousand demonic voices all at one time jumbled together and calling out my imminent death. I held onto the doorknob with all my might as it began to twist and turn in my hands as whatever was outside that door tried to get inside the bathroom with me. The door shook with the violent tugging from the other side, threatening to tear the door from the hinges. I thought ironically for a moment that it was a good thing that I was sitting on the toilet right then, because otherwise what was going so freely into the toilet would have been flowing down my legs. Time seemed to stretch on and on as the struggle continued. I battled with the creature on the other side of the door for possession of the doorknob, but I do not know for how long. It could have been only seconds, or it may have been hours. But for however long it was, the tears rushed down my cheeks and I screamed in terror the entire time. In a single moment, it just stopped, and I was by myself in the bathroom, still shrieking in terror at nothing. The noise was gone. The tugging and pulling of the door was over, and there was just nothing. I sat there shaking violently for what seemed like an eternity, not daring to let go of the doorknob lest whatever beast I had wrestled with was still on the other side of the door, silently waiting to hear me let go and breathe a sigh of relief, only to pounce and tear the door from its hinges. I didn't relax a single muscle until I heard my mom's footsteps above me and heard her call for me. I screamed to her that I was downstairs and to come down and help me. Mom came down after a few moments and asked if I was in the bathroom. I said yes, and that I'd be out in just a minute. I quickly cleaned up and hesitantly opened the door, hoping that it was really my sweet mother and not a horrible trick of some kind. But it really was my mom, and I threw myself into her arms, sobbing and trying to tell her what had happened. She looked at me skeptically and only said, What's your blood sugar? I said, What? Again, she said, What's your blood sugar? When was the last time you checked it? I had been diagnosed as a type 1 diabetic just two years before. And although I took great care of myself on my own, I still needed my parents' help from time to time. She obviously thought it was one of those times. I realised that once again, she didn't believe me, instead thinking that it must be my overactive imagination, and that it may have also been related to a low blood sugar or something of that sort. So I went upstairs and dutifully took my blood sugar for her. I don't remember what it was, but it wasn't too high or too low. But I was left with remaining sadness that my mother didn't believe what I had told her. It wasn't the first time odd things had happened, and it wouldn't be the last. But years later, and the way things turned out, she would believe me just fine. My family has had a history of hauntings, or living in haunted houses, for four generations now. The stories have been handed down from one generation to the next, with me being in the third generation. I recall one story that my grandma used to tell me. The first time she told me I thought it was funny, or at least part of it was funny. The older I got and the more I experienced the paranormal myself, the less funny it became. She told the story of how one night she was up later than everyone else in the house. As she put it, she was burning the midnight oil which is exactly what they did back then. She was only a teenager, and since she was born in 1911, that would make it around 1925 or so that this happened. Electricity still wasn't available in rural Saskatchewan, then so the term burning the midnight oil was literal, because they used coal oil lamps to light their rooms at night. She said it was about midnight when she ran out of oil, and she was wanting some more so she could continue reading her book. Her uncle lived a few miles away, and even though it was dark, she decided to ride her horse over the fields to his house to borrow some. She knew him to be someone who liked to stay up late just like she did. So she got on her horse bareback, still wearing her nightgown, and rode across the dry prairie fields to his home. When she got there, she said the house was brightly lit from within. She thought her aunt and uncle must have both been up late working on something important. Thinking she would play a prank on her uncle, she decided to ride her horse right up to the door, placing the horse's head directly in front of it. She thought it would be funny that when he opened the door, 
what would be there was the horse's head instead of a person. She giggled to herself, positioned the horse in front of the door, then leaned over and knocked. The house went completely dark in the blink of an eye. Today, that may not seem like it's that big of a deal, but back then, they were only working with coal oil lamps. From the amount of light that had been coming from within my grandmother's estimated, there had to be at least 10 or 12 coal oil lamps burning at the same time, all in different rooms. For all the lights to go out at exactly the same time, there would have to be the same amount of people inside as lamps, and they would all have to blow out the lamps at exactly the same moment. As she was pondering this thought, she noticed a glow on the front door as the moon hit metal. She took a closer look and realised that there was a padlock on the front door on the outside. She said that her aunt and uncle only used the padlock on the outside of the door when they were going to be away for an extended period and wouldn't be back for a few days. She said that the hairs all over her body stood on end and she was scared to death. So she turned the horse around as fast as she could and raced away from the house and back home as fast as the horse could gallop. She said she told her uncle about it when he got back and also others, but no one really believed her story. My mum has always had spirits and haunts in her life, most of them bad. They seemed to follow her right from childhood in every house she lived in. This is just one of those stories, but there are many. My mum and I were out shopping one day, and we ended up at a local thrift store. They had this deal where they showcased upcoming items behind a glass, and if you liked something, you had to come back it for the day that it would be going on sale. This was a big attraction, because of course they showcased the best items they had donated to them. And on sale day, people were lined up at the door to be the first one to buy a coveted item. So we were looking at the items on display, and my mom pointed out a porcelain doll. A clown. I looked at it, and immediately my whole body shuddered and became goosebumps. I've always had a sixth sense, and this clown gave me a huge case of the willies. I told her it wasn't a good clown. My mom was completely enamoured with it, though. I warned her I got a bad feeling from it, and please don't buy it. Two weeks later, I went to her house, and I ended up on her back deck. Sitting in one of the deck chairs, that was that damn clown. I went inside and said, Mom, how could you? I told you that thing gave me the creeps. She told me she was drawn to it, so the day it went on sale, she headed to the store early and stood in line. No one else seemed interested in it, so she took it as a sign she was meant to have it. I asked her why she was sitting outside. She said my nephew Jay was seriously weirded out by it, and he begged her to get rid of it. Jay has lived with his grandmother his entire life, and at that time, he was about 16 years old. I asked Jay about it, and he asked me if I liked it. I told him the truth. He said mom wouldn't get rid of it, but did put it outside. He also said, you sense there's something wrong with it too, right? Did you notice that no matter what direction you're looking at it from, it seems to be looking back at you? That definitely had not gone unnoticed by me. Fast forward a week or so, I noticed the clown was no longer sitting in the chair outside, so I asked my mom about it. She said our entire family was hating it, so she got rid of it. I felt somewhat relieved that it was gone, but the house felt different. Being that she was touchy on the subject, I just dropped it. That wasn't the end of it though. My mom was also raising my niece Amy, who was just over a year old at the time. I would go over to visit, and Amy never wanted to be in her room. I would go in there to grab some toys, and she wouldn't walk over the threshold. She just stayed in the hallway, and when I asked her to help me take the toys to the living room, she would shake her head no. I just thought she was being that age and left it alone. Then she became suspicious of an antique wardrobe that sat in her room. When it was bedtime, I would take her in, and she would stare warily at it. Then she would look at me, put a finger over her lips and cryptically say, shh, and point to the wardrobe. She didn't want me to leave her in the room alone, so bedtime became difficult trying to rock her to sleep while she fussed. Another week passed, 
and my mom called and asked me to come over. I said sure and drove to her house. She said, something really scared me last night. She had been in bed for only about five minutes, laying on her side when she felt a heaviness descend behind her onto the bed. That tired feeling left her as she became hyper alert. She wasn't quite sure what to do and was trying to decide when a male body came up behind her and pressed himself with his erect penis into her back. It put its leg over her legs and an arm around her torso. She froze in fear, not quite knowing what to do and trying to comprehend what was going on. She knew she had locked all the doors just moments before heading to bed. Had someone come into the house with evil intent? She said she put her hand on the man's hand that was over her torso when her finger felt very long pointy fingernails at the end of its three fingers and a thumb. She could feel breath on the back of her neck and she knew it was waiting for her to make the next move. She struggled to get up, but it held her fast and wouldn't let her move. She knew she had to think quickly and she mustered up her best pissed off voice and firmly said, let go of me. He just pressed in harder and held her tighter. Louder this time, with real anger in her voice, she said, get off me, you bastard. She kicked and struggled and finally it let go of her. She jumped out of bed immediately, flicked on the light to find nothing but her empty bed. She looked on the other side of the bed, underneath it, and in the closet. She went through the house, checking her grandkids' rooms, before looking into every closet and cranny in the house, only to find no one else there but her family, with the doors still locked from the inside. I was obviously shocked. I didn't know what to say. My mum has never been one to make up stories, so I had to believe her. I knew she hadn't dreamt it, but I also didn't understand why. But I'm also acutely aware that spirits seem to follow her and our entire family from house to house. Another week passed with odd things happening. There would be a mug placed on the kitchen counter to fill with coffee, but when Jay turned with the pot to fill it, it was no longer there. He would look around and finally find the mug down the hall in the bathroom. Amy also would not enter her room without an adult, then cower while pointing at the closet or wardrobe. There were constant oddities like that, but things finally came to a head one night. My mom called me in the morning and again and asked if I could come as soon as possible. She sounded quite frantic, so I headed over immediately. Amy was watching a kids program in the living room so my mom could speak to me in the kitchen. She said something really bad had happened the night before. She was sitting in the living room getting Amy ready for bed when she heard a loud slam against the wall down the dark hallway where Amy's room was. They both became stiff and stared down towards her room. My mom said whatever it was coming down the wall hall towards them made a loud flapping sound that got louder the closer it got to them. My mom hugged Amy to her tightly as a pair of enormous black wings came barreling at them, then paused at the entrance to the stairs by the kitchen, pivoted, and loudly shrieked as it spiralled down the stairs into the basement. Stunned, my mom and Amy sat there for a moment, not moving or saying anything. Finally, Amy wriggled away from Grandma, cautiously made her way towards the stairs, and looked down. When Amy turned to Grandma, pointed down the stairs and whispered, shh, my mom all but lost it. Amy slept on the couch that night while my mom slept in her easy chair. My mom was shaking by the end of the story and she had tears in her eyes. She said to me, I need you here because I have to do something important. She went down the hallway to Amy's room and I heard the closet door open. When she came back cradling the clown doll in her arms, I swore at her. Amy saw the clown and ran to me frantically saying, shh, 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 and was crying in fear. My mom said she needed to take the doll out front to throw it out. But first, she was going to smash that porcelain head to bits. When she went outside, Amy clung to me in tears. My mom knew Amy would need me when she went outside with the clown. Again and again, my mom slammed the clown's head against the pavement. But no matter how many times or how violently she did it, it wouldn't break. 
After many attempts to shatter the head failed, my mom defeatedly buried it in the garbage can that would be picked up the next day. She couldn't do anything else at that point, but just had it gone from her life. Later, I asked her why she had kept it. She said it just felt right buying it and she absolutely adored it, but the rest of us were creeped out by it, with good reason, obviously. She said she put it up at the top of Amy's closet one day when Amy was at daycare and she had covered it so it wouldn't be seen when I went in there. I hadn't seen it and neither did Amy, but I felt something was off in the house every time I went over. She had assured me it was gone, so I just trusted her. But Amy felt it too and was scared by what resided not only in her closet, but also in the wardrobe. Jay felt it and experienced strange things as well but nothing compared to the black wings in the creature in my mom's bed. Needless to say, all the weird stuff stopped after that. My mom has always trusted my intuition, and hers was certainly off that day in the thrift shop. But I always say, we always choose what's familiar to us. When you live in a haunted house your whole life, that becomes your normal, however abnormal that may seem to others. And the normalcy my mom felt when she saw that damn clown felt good somehow, no matter how much the rest of us felt the evil it possessed. My girlfriend lives with her parents in a home that they built. Bear with me as I try to explain this. On the top level of her house, there are four rooms. Her parents' room, her room, her bathroom, and a spare bedroom where her now-deceased grandfather lived before he passed away a couple of years ago. Her house has always had weird vibes, shadows that move across doors, people in the corner of your eye, and weird unexplained cold spots in random but consistent locations. All these things I have considered easy to write off since I don't consider myself a skeptic, but I'm not anxious to go out looking for anything paranormal either. The way the top floor is laid out, you can see the spare bedroom doorway in her bathroom mirror if you keep the door ajar. In this case, it was. I was brushing my teeth while she was downstairs getting water for us two. Nothing unusual. I got an overwhelming sense that I was being watched. Something that happens in her house, but I've never felt anything quite like this. I stopped brushing and looked up. And there in the mirror was someone staring back at me from the spare bedroom door. I thought it was just my mind playing tricks on me. So I continued brushing and looked up a few seconds later and he was still there. He was an older looking man in a flat cap and played pajamas. I turned to look over my shoulder and there was absolutely no one in that doorway. After confirming with her that no one else was even on the same floor as me when this happened, I'm left with no idea of who this could be. I spoke to her mom the next day and she claims her father never wore anything like that and didn't quite match the description of what I saw either. I don't think she really believes me. I live with my mom and cats in a two story plus basement home, which we just recently moved into. Before this, we were living in a basement apartment as it helped us to get back on our feet over the last year after some pretty heavy stuff in the family. In most of the houses I lived in growing up, strange things happened in the majority of them. For example, a basketball randomly bouncing in my hallway in the early hours of the morning. But something about that basement apartment just kind of halted all of the strange activity happening at home. And this is when I started becoming more aware of the shadows cold spots, and more at my girlfriend's house. In saying that, now in my new living situation, it seems that for some unknown reason, whatever has been following me around is back in full action. I'll list some of my experiences to make it easier to follow. Cupboards open here on their own, literally. You can shut them then leave the room for 30 seconds and they'll be open when you come back. My oven and stove like turn on by themselves all the time. I have a small fan on my nightstand that turns on by itself. The door to the basement will be closed in the morning 
despite my mother and I never doing that, as the cat needs access to their litter boxes down there. I'm usually up later than mom, so she will check the locks on the front and back door, and then I'll double check when I go to bed to make sure they're locked, just for both of them to be unlocked in the morning. Things go missing and reappear suddenly. For example, my mom has two Christmas ornaments that she absolutely loves. While we were decorating the tree this year, she hung the first one and the second one was nowhere to be found. When we both started looking for it, we were on the last bag of tree decorations that we store in clear plastic bags. She and I both looked for it in this bag when we were about 10 ornaments left in the bag. Not an overwhelming amount of them or anything, yet we both couldn't find it. After I explained the story to my girlfriend after she came over that night, I picked up the bag and sure enough, the ornament was in there. What has really started to startle me though, is two things that happened to me within the last week or so. I was walking up the stairs to go to bed last week and something tugged on the back of my shirt, almost causing me to fall down the stairs. Then just two nights ago, I was laying on my phone playing some dumb games to, to try and sleep. And then all of a sudden, I just became completely still. I didn't know what was getting into me. I just had this overwhelming, anxious and fearful feeling. After about 30 seconds, I started feeling cold breaths on the back of my neck. I started to completely freak out at this point and just stayed still for about five minutes until suddenly the breathing stopped and all my negative feelings vanished like they were never there. Does anyone have any idea what this could be? Why would the activity stop and that particular house? And why is it back so strong in this new one? This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always like camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail I was going to take, packed my camping gear in my rifle and jumped in my truck. I get to this trail early in the morning and hike about 15 to 20 miles in until I find the right spot and head off the trail to find a place to put my tent up. I stumble upon this nice sized clearing and decide that it's a nice beautiful spot to settle down. I'm exhausted at this point but set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line and managed to get a fire going. I roast some weenies and start to hear a sound in the distance underneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal, most likely a deer with a lame leg as it sounded like the animal was making a walking and dragging noise. I felt bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go find it and put it out of its misery. Think nothing of it after that and go about eating my food. After I eat, I douse the fire and crawl into my tent and insert myself into my sleeping bag. I decide that even in my exhausted and relaxed state, I can't go to sleep, so I pull out a book I brought with me and start to read by the light of my lamp. Hours go by and I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down and listen to this animal walk and drag across the clearing towards my tent. It's really loud at this point and it now sounds like the hooves are all being heavily planted, with the dragging noise following seconds after like the deer is dragging something along. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing and stops, and I hear nothing. No breathing, I mean, not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and look into the clearing, nothing but trees and darkness. What the fuck? Unnerved at this point, I zip the tent back up and sit there listening for the noises. Nothing. Just the crickets in the breeze. I decided that there were a lot of strange noises in the woods and tried to not let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right, then women's laughter and sticks snapping far off to my left. I'm up now, wondering if what I'm hearing is really what I'm hearing or just a product of being half asleep. 
I hear more faint laughter from a couple other different directions, all different, and confirm that it's real. The noises are closing in, and I grab my rifle, preparing to fire a warning shot off in the air, in case they came too close. Something about this laughter, how far in I was, the noise earlier, and the time of night, told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed that the nightlight was dead quiet. Even the wind was making no noise. I decided enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line and saw nothing. Listened intently to my surroundings, no laughing, and the forest sounds had returned. Relaxing just a bit and figuring that scared whoever off, I sat down and in my exhausted state, I fell asleep. I woke up later in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety, and it was still dark outside. I immediately hear two people whispering not too far from my tent. Alert, grab my rifle and listen to what they're saying. I can't make out much, but I hear something about being lost, so I shout, Hey, who's there? The voices fall silent. I shout again, Are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly, a huge burst of flame, like a flamethrower, erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up and sprint out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trial was. I hiked until sunrise back to my truck, with my head over my shoulder the entire way. Never heard anyone follow me, never saw anyone or anything the whole day, but couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me, like I left all my gear in the woods that night. I recently moved in with two of my friends, and in the past two or three months, I've experienced some unexplainable things in my room. For context, my roommates are a couple, and as such share a bedroom on the main floor of the house. The basement is finished, and I have a fairly large room in the back corner. The house itself isn't really scary or anything, and I wouldn't necessarily say that I got that typical feeling of dread during any of these experiences. They've all happened fairly late at night, usually as I'm drifting to dreamland or already asleep. Here are the most prevalent ones. I always fall asleep on either of my sides. I'm a girl with fairly long hair, which I always part off center on the side. I know this probably doesn't seem relevant, but it will help me explain why I think someone or something was there with me. I stayed up fairly late, and as I was starting to doze off this particular night, Something touched my hair, enough to bring me back to full wakefulness. At first, I thought that because of how far my part is to the side, that gravity had eventually taken over a large piece of it, and it slid down across the part. I reached up to move it back, only to find that my part was still intact, and that side of my hair was tucked behind my ear. I got a minor feeling of unease, but was very tired and started to fall back asleep. Right as I was about to reach full sleep, it happened again, this time a little less gentle. It was a similar feeling to just slightly running your fingers through the top part of your hair to sweep it out of your eyes. Again, I was woken up, but still didn't feel scared or unsafe, just unsettled. Nothing else happened that night. In a very similar circumstance, I had just turned off the TV set my alarm and put my phone on the side table. I got all my blankets situated and rolled onto my side, so I was now facing the nearest wall. On the side my back was facing, I felt the very recognisable sensation of someone sitting down on the edge of my bed. Again, I didn't feel unsafe, but a little creeped out. I decided to look over my shoulder, and you guessed it, nothing was there. This happened last night, and while I didn't feel horrified, it's definitely the event that made me most uncomfortable and a little bit scared. I listen to the app Calm every night as I'm falling asleep. Either a story, 
gentle music, or white noise sounds. Last night, I had chosen the city rain option. I woke up sometime during the night to a tapping sound, which probably woke me because it sounded different enough from the rain. To me, it sounded similar to when a girl has acrylic nails and is texting. For some reason, I knew I didn't want to open my eyes, but I did anyway. In my blurry sleep vision, coupled with not having my contacts in, I saw what I think was a man wearing a suit standing next to my night table, positioned so that he wasn't right next to the bed, but the table was in between him and the bed. One hand was at his side and the other was tapping my phone with one finger. I quickly shut my eyes and when I opened them, he was gone. The tapping sound was still there, but gradually merged back with the rain sounds, making me feel crazy. It's been hard to digest this dining experience, and not in the ways you might think. I've been trying to make sense of it and to find others who have experienced something similar. But at the end of the day, all I've come up with is loose rumors. I know it was real, and I know it was out there, but that's all I got so far. Back in February, I was stood up on a date. I'd dressed up all nice and brought her flowers. She just texted me that she'd met someone, not even 20 minutes before we were supposed to meet. I'm thinking she'd been juggling several people at once and decided to settle on someone else. No matter the reason, I was left with a bouquet of sunflowers and nothing to do. As I was walking home, I decided I was going to treat myself. In the immortal words of RuPaul, if you can't love yourself, how the hell are you going to love somebody else? That's how I ended up outside the Cardinal Secret Kitchen. This was the kind of place I'd always passed by. It was just out of sight enough to be out of mind, and I'd never thought about going there before. It looked a bit too fancy, and it had this intimidating maitre d' outside. A hawk-nosed woman who stared at me as I considered checking the place out. But I was fired up. I wanted to do something different. Break some moulds. Be risky. Go out of my way to try something new. So I thought, what the hell, and stepped up. If I just thought about it, I would have realised I'd never seen this place before in my life. Table for one? She asked. Yeah, how? If one's available, yeah. She looked knowingly at my bouquet of flowers and gave me a wry smile. I'm sure we can arrange something. Please come with me. Of course. A pity table. We followed a wide staircase to a set of large double doors leading down into a large cellar. It was this wide open space with cobblestone walls and marble floors. The first room had a sort of lounge area with an oak hewn bar and four sets of tables spread out across the room. There were already plenty of people up there, most of them very much not looking for a table for one. Most of them had their coats on and looked about to leave, some of them bringing meals and doggy bags. Business like type of people, laughing and drinking. I stepped up to a large metal door as the maitre d' held out her hand. Pardon, she said. No phones in the dining area. She pointed to a small sign on the side of the door. A little phone with a red circle and a cross. Of course, I smiled like an idiot. Where do I... She held out a little silver tray, which I put it on. We can charge it for you while you dine if you wish. Sure, uh, thanks. Absolutely. If you just keep going to the next room... Antonio will meet you. I thanked her as I stepped through the doors. I actually thanked her. As I walked through the door, I came into a dining area. It was a long room, about 50 by 30 feet, with an identical metal door on the other side. I realised I was still carrying my bouquet of blue sunflowers, so I dropped them in a little garbage can by the door. There were eight tables in total, four on each side of a red carpet. There were thin mirrors on the side of the wall, as if to simulate slim basement windows. The large door swung shut behind me rather forcefully. The dining hall was full of dinner guests, most of which seemed to be waiting for their order. I did as I'd been told, and just kept going straight through. I opened the door on the opposite side. Another room, almost identical. This place seemed larger than I thought. 
I could have sworn it would have one main room and at most one side room. This seemed excessive. Then again, I'd never been there before. Still, I'd lived in this town for seven years and never heard anyone even mention it. Another 50 by 30 feet of dining area. There were a bit fewer guests in the second room, but no waiter, so I just kept going. There was no Antonio coming to meet me, so I figured there was a room even further off. There was yet another door on the opposite side of the room after all. Just how big was this place? I noticed some of the guests were giving me side eyes, as if I'd stepped into something private. At the moment, I wasn't really paying attention, but thinking back on it, I think at least half of them were taken in foreign languages. Just as I was about to step through the next door, it opened. Two guests stepped out, carrying a paper bag. A doggy bag, like the ones I'd seen in the lounge. Figured I was on the right track. But as I stepped through and the door closed behind me, I realized something was off. The third room, identical to the other two, was completely empty. Not a single dinner guest. 50 by 30. The same type of tables and everything, but empty of people. I thought I'd stepped into some place I shouldn't have, like it was closed off for some reason. I turned around to head back, thinking I might have missed something. But the room I just came from was also empty. I just stopped, as my heart skipped a beat. I was standing in the doorway between two identical empty rooms, looking back and forth. I was having trouble wrapping my brain around it. I was sure there'd been people there. It was messing with my head. Had I been turned around somehow? Had I imagined it? Hello, I called out. I, uh, I'm looking for Antonio. No answer. Just these two beautiful rooms full of dimly lit tables. I could hear my voice bounce off the cobblestone walls. I decided to go back to ask for directions. Bother or not. I was getting uncomfortable. I walked through the room I came from, now empty, and opened the door on the other side. Again, an empty room. The room looked identical, no matter which side you were coming from, and it was messing with my head. Standing in the doorway, I couldn't tell where I'd come from, and now it was all empty. I turned around towards what I knew to be backwards. It had to be, and I just started walking through another door into another empty room. Another door, another room. Yet another door and yet another room. I could feel my pulse rising as I started the jog. Another door, another, another. All leading to the same kind of empty room with the same cobblestone walls. The jog turned into a run and then a sprint. I didn't stop until I collapsed against one of the doors, gasping for air. I must have run through 20 doors. I figured I'd gone insane. Something must have broken inside of me. Maybe I was having some kind of seizure. I collapsed against one of the doors, trying to catch my breath. There was a garbage can on each side of the room, placed in an identical way. Out of exhaustion, I checked it. My blue sunflower bouquet was in there. How? I dropped it in the first room. This wasn't it. I picked it up and clutched it to my chest like a teddy bear. This was impossible. What I was experiencing was impossible. There was no way this place was so big, and there was no way everyone would just decide to collectively leave. Counting the petals on the bouquet, I started thinking that maybe the place itself was crazy, and not me. If I was sane enough to calmly count, to think things through, maybe I wasn't the problem. The maitre d' had taken my phone. That could be a coincidence. Then again, even if she hadn't, I might not have got coverage underground anyway. But it got me thinking. Maybe there was some sort of method to this madness. What did they want from me? As I kept walking forward, I started noticing little changes. The tablecloths were a darker shade, and the red carpet started to look black. There were irregularities on the floor, making me almost trip over my own feet. The mirrors on the wall were less reflective until they were just glass. The cobblestone patterns were changing room by room, going from even sizes to these absurd and almost biological shapes. The simple dining room chairs were changing into stools, office chairs, and even a beanbag at one point. It seemed the further I went, 
the less the place resembled a dining room hall. Like I was going further and further away from what it was supposed to look like. Devolution, in a way. One room at a time. I tried turning around, but it seemed that whatever de direction I went was still forward. Good thing I had my bouquet to comfort me. I must have wandered around for hours. My feet were killing me. So at one point, I sat down at one of the tables. That's when I noticed there was a servant's bell. I stood right back up. I was sure it hadn't been there. I'd seen hundreds of iterations of this room and there'd never been any bells. Had it appeared as I sat down? As I put my hand over it, I considered what to do. Whoever led me into this must have anticipated me ringing that bell. It was part of their plan. And while I didn't know much of their plan, I knew for a fact that it couldn't be anything good. These were not caring people. Or they wouldn't have put me in this position to begin with. This had to be nefarious, one way or the other. So no, I wouldn't ring the bell. Not without planning. I had no idea what to believe, but I had to expect the worst. One of the dining room chairs had been replaced with a bar stool held up by a large metal pipe going down the middle. It was a bit wobbly, so I managed to pick it apart. I would feel a lot better ringing that bell if I was armed with a hefty chunk of metal. But I took it one step further. I pulled down the lights on both sides of the room, turning the room from dimly lit to pitch black. I took off my shoes as they clacked against the floor. They couldn't hear me, just my socks. Now I feel ready. Someone had to answer for this. I rang the bell. I hid behind the door as I heard the metal hinges squeal. I was fully committed to just beating the shit out of whoever stepped through, but something stopped me. The way they talked just sounded weird. Their steps were large and meaty, like slapping a large stake against stone over and over. Long, heavy steps. Also, a sort of crackling noise. A paper bag, like the doggy bags. I just stood there listening. I snapped out of it as I heard this awful moan, followed by a pair of heavy arms slamming into the table with the bell. The sound of heavy meat being flung onto a stone slab. Whoever or whatever that was, I wasn't going to hit it with a pipe. No way. Instead, I just stepped out onto the carpets and felt around for the door handle. There was something wet on the floor where that thing had stepped. As soon as I touched the handle, I heard a muffled voice. It came from somewhere low, possibly inside something. The shrill voice of a young man panicked. There! He's there! As I pulled the door open, I expected the dining room again, possibly with minor changes, like things had gradually changed over time so far. But no, this looked like the original room. There were even a few guests, just three of them spread out among the tables. My first feeling was this intense relief, but it got stuck in the back of my throat. Something was off with these people. One of them, a man in his early 50s, didn't have any eyes. Next to him was a young man in her 20s, sporting a pearl necklace made of eyeballs. In the very back was an older woman, missing her lower jaw. They all turned their heads towards me, grabbed their silverware and stood up. Behind me, from the door I just passed through, I could hear meaty steps coming. I just ran, flailing my pipe against anyone coming even close. I clocked the middle-aged man on the side of the head, collapsing him over one of the tables. He didn't even scream. He made no sound whatsoever, not even acknowledging that I'd hit him. I could hear the door open behind me as I burst forward, crashing through to the next room. Just a single guest. A kid. No more than seven years old, chewing on an ear. Flickering lights made it look like he moved in stop motion. On the other side of the room, the garbage can had been knocked over, revealing a pile of paper bags. I just ran. The kid was nowhere fast enough to get close to me. I could hear his lips smack as he kept snacking on the ear like a dog. As I passed the pile of paper bags, I could hear voices coming from them. Sad, desperate voices. Wait, come back, take me with you. 
Wake me, please. I just kept going, my heart pounding. Not so much from the running, but the absolute panic. The feeling that no matter how far I ran, and no matter which direction I went, I was going the wrong way. I was just going further and further out as the cardinal secret kitchen was slowly starting to forget what it was supposed to look like. After another 12 rooms, I could no longer hear the steps behind me. Then again, it wasn't as if there were many places to hide. It just had to keep going forward. It had catch up to me soon enough. The guests were fewer and fewer. It was as if they appeared more frequently the closer I got to the waiter. Antonio, I guess. I had no idea what time it was. All I knew was that I was exhausted. I decided I'd go 50 rooms in total before I stopped to rest, just to put some kind of distance between me and whatever was out there. After 40 rooms, I called it quits. By now, the dining room was barely recognisable. The cobblestone walls now looked like red tendrils and the ceiling was so low I could just barely stand up straight. The tables were just slabs of stone sticking out of the ground, covered in some kind of plastic sheet. The ground, which had turned to dirt. The red carpet had turned into a puddle of muddy water, and the garbage cans were just hollow pieces of log. Nevertheless, I collapsed in a corner of the room. I listened for footsteps, but couldn't hear anything. I grabbed the plastic sheets from the tables and covered myself in them. My bouquet of blue sunflowers leaned against the wall along with my metal pipe. My hands were cramping from holding them so hard. I couldn't imagine myself falling asleep in that place, but I did. I got a few minutes here or there. After what felt like a night of rest, I got up. Thinking it was all a bad dream, my heart sank as I opened my eyes. I was still there. This was my reality. The cardinal secret kitchen was still there. This was my reality for at least six days. Going from room to room, seeing it morph and change over time. At one point it was a forest. At another point it was a sinking ship. I managed to find some edible bark on a tree that had replaced a garbage can. At one point I walked through what looked like a travel booking agency of some kind, complete with brochures. It wasn't even readable brochures, just symbols that sort of looked like an alphabet. Like the place was just trying to emulate something to an approximate. I did hear footsteps at times. When I did, I broke the lights, or whatever equivalent was there, and hid. As soon as I slipped past the waiter, I'd run through the door and just keep going. No matter what I heard, that muffled voice scream at me. The carpet was often replaced with a ditch or a puddle of water, so I did have something to drink. It did have a faint whiff of ammonia, but when you've literally crawled from room to room, looking for moisture, you stop caring. My sweat-soaked clothes were cutting into my skin, and I'd gone dozens of rashes. I tied my socks into a makeshift bandana to keep sweat out of my eyes. I'd picked up tablecloths along the way, to make myself a sort of bag. This allowed me to pick up little things of use, like ashtrays, loose rocks, firewood, and similar things. I was shaking from exhaustion as I stepped through another door. That was the one thing that never changed, the door. The same metal door, the same metal handle. I'd examined it for hours, looking for patterns or clues. There was nothing, just a door. But this time, I stepped into a train, a night train. Four sets of seats next to four sets of windows. It was fresh, the seats were soft and the rhythm of the track was almost hypnotic. It took me a full 10 seconds to realize I wasn't alone. On the other side of the room was a woman. She looked about my age. Unlike other guests I'd seen, she didn't look like a complete horror. There were no missing limbs, no threat, she was just reading a pocketbook, paying me no attention. As I walked up to her, she put it aside and met my eyes. Suddenly, she looked concerned. Uh, are you alright? she asked. No, I huffed, clearing my throat. I, uh, I'm not alright. What happened to you? You look, you look awful. You, uh, I... 
I'm not proud of it. I just broke down sobbing. Talking again made me feel like a person. Like there was a chance I might make it out of there. It reminded me that I had something to lose and that I was a victim. Despite me looking like absolute shit, she hugged me and comforted me. I broke down in the middle of the train car, just bawling my eyes out. Holding her tight, I felt my salty tears soak into her hair. A person. A living person. She could help. Do you... Do you have a phone? Can you call her? The police? I cried. Sure, sure, sit down, please. You want me to fetch an attendant? No, please, just... Just call them. D don't go. Alright, no problem. Where is your stop? I don't even know where... Footsteps. My single thought was, no. Not again. Not now. Not when I found someone. The meaty steps were getting closer. I grabbed her hand and pulled her out of her seat, and she almost dropped her phone. What are you... He's coming, I cried. Please, we, we have to go. Let go of me, you're... The door on the opposite side of the room opened. A large black silhouette resembling the image of a man, covered in some kind of slick back goo, holding a doggy bag in his left hand. Impossibly long fingers, with at least six joints bending in both directions. It was so tall that it leaned its head to the side just to fit in the room. It held up its paper bag as if pointing it towards me. There, the bag wheezed. He's there. Come on, I screamed. Come on. She tore away from me and pressed herself against the window. Clearly, she was more afraid of me than what was coming towards us. It was as if she couldn't see it. I reached out to her, but she just screamed and fought me off. The thing, the waiter, was coming towards me with long, multi-jointed legs. Meaty steps slapping onto the carpet, leaving black footprints behind. I couldn't stay. I couldn't drag her along. I just had to keep going. Door, door, door. Room after room after room. I was growing more and more exhausted. Not only physically, but I was losing my will to run. Help was long gone by now. I was trying to convince myself that maybe they weren't all bad. Maybe they wouldn't kill me. Maybe they could be reasoned with. Finally, as I collapsed into a room looking like an approximation of a 40s roadside diner, I just couldn't get up. I tried crawling forward, but as I reached the door on the opposite side, I couldn't go on. The waiter opened the door behind me on the opposite side of the room. Finally, the bag wheezed. Finally, he's done. They were right. I was. With a final effort, I grabbed the metal garbage can by the door to try and pull myself up. Instead, I just knocked it over, spilling paper bags all over the floor. Bags, moving just slightly, whispering for me to take them along. I just collapsed back onto the floor, preparing myself to die right there on the clean floor of a copycat diner. I noticed I'd fallen on my makeshift back and crushed my now dried bouquet of blue sunflowers. The petals were barely hanging on, but some still were. With a desperate effort, I looked through whatever trash I'd picked up along the way, but there was nothing to save me. I couldn't beat this thing with a pipe or a rock. This thing was a monster. As the creature loomed over me, I could barely hear my thoughts. My blood was running through my mind, pounding at the back of my eyes. There was a sound coming from my throat, like my body wanted to scream more than my mind did. I grabbed the closest things I could, and I shielded myself. The worst part was the waiting, not knowing what would happen. But nothing happened. I looked up. The thing was just looking down at me, holding that paper bag in one hand. Hello. This time, the sound was coming from the creature itself. I noticed I was clutching one of the paper bags from the garbage can. That was the first thing I'd grabbed. I could feel a faint outline of a face through the paper. Hello, I said. I, uh, I'll take, take, take this to go. It just looked at me. My mind was just a thousand miles an hour. I was trying to figure out four different ways to run at once, but my body wasn't listening to me. Here, for, for your trouble. 
I handed it my dried bouquet of blue sunflowers. It gingerly picked it up with two fingers, studying it with intent. Hello. It pondered the gesture, studying the flowers, and just walked right past me. I laid there, counting my breaths. The footsteps kept going. Gone. Clutching the paper bag to my chest, I stepped through the door. All of a sudden, I was outdoors. A February night, just outside the double doors leading to the Cardinal Street kitchen. My aching bare feet were inches into fresh snow, and the wind was howling. I opened the bag, just to find a sealed container with fresh chicken tikka masala. I barely remembered what happened next. I fumbled my way into a corner shop, begging for them to call the police. I remember a patrol woman asking me questions about my whereabouts. Apparently, I'd been reported missing. After my attempt at an explanation, they labelled it a kidnapping. But of course, nothing came of it. There is no such place as the Cardinal Street Kitchen. There never was. That cellar is just part of an industrial warehouse. It had never been a kitchen or social club of any kind. While the investigation didn't lead anywhere, I've since heard rumours. There are people online who have taken pictures of it. The same maitre d'. The same doors leading to the same lounge. Hell, some people talk about their friends going missing after texting about the place. But no one else seems to have come out of there and lived to tell the tale. I think that to escape the Cardinal Secret Kitchen... I had to do what was the least expected of me, to act like a guest, like I was supposed to be there. If the woman I met on the train is out there, I'd love to talk to her, to explain and to apologise. If she reads this by any chance, I'm sorry. And if you pass by this place anywhere in your travels, just, just don't. Just walk away. So I'll get right to it. About 10 years ago when I was about 16, I used to babysit for a family. Their daughter was about one or two years old when this happened. I'll call her Ellie. So the day of the incident, I decided to take Ellie out for a walk in her stroller. It was in the middle of the day in the summer and in a really nice neighborhood. So neither Ellie or me had any reason to feel anxious or scared about working there. There were people out in their gardens, etc. Well, me and Ellie had been walking out for about half an hour, and we had come to a part of the neighbourhood which I hadn't been in before. All of a sudden, it feels as if I got a shower of ice-cold water, and at the same time, Ellie started to look uncomfortable in the stroller, whining a bit. The feeling did not disappear, and I just felt this awful feeling of dread. I continued walking, and around the next bend, there was a smaller open field. At this field, there was an old Norse and Viking burial site. I live in Sweden. Practically, just some big stones in a formation. The feeling of dread did not disappear, but rather became worse the further I walked. The best way to describe it was like pure hate, like we weren't welcome at this place. It felt like I was walking in a dark alley in the middle of the night, in some really sketchy place. I frantically kept looking over my shoulder, expecting to get attacked or something. Ellie also sta started acting more and more strange, as if she was scared and uncomfortable. After about 10 minutes of this, I couldn't take it anymore, so I just turned and went back from where we came. When we got about 20 meters from the field with the burial site, Ellie started hysterically screaming, looking straight at a hedge we were passing, as if she saw someone in there. I picked her up, and held her on the arm closest to the hedge, and she was like throwing herself towards my other arm to get as far away from the hedge as possible. The thing is, I could see through the hedge and there wasn't anything there. Not even like a cat or anything. She kept looking straight as if as we passed it, still in full-blown panic mode. When we came to the field, she motioned towards the stones, looking at me, and then back to the stones. Still, there wasn't anything in sight. I could actually see how she followed something with her eyes. I was so fucking scared at this point, and at the same time, trying to act normal to try and calm Ellie down. The weirdest thing 
was that when we came to the exact spot where it felt like I got a cold shower, all feelings of dread and fear disappeared. Like from a hundred to zero, from one step to the next. Not only for me, but Ellie also went from panic to calm at the exact same moment. She wanted to sit in her stroller again and was her normal happy self. Anyone in here who has any idea what this could have been? It's been 10 years and I still haven't dared to step foot in that part of the neighborhood again. I've never experienced such a strong feeling of dread, like something just hated us being there. About four years ago, my grandmother died in her house. She died of cancer and it was a peaceful death. Then about four months after that, my step-grandfather died in the house. This one was a bit more brutal. He had gone into a big depression after my grandmother had died and stopped talking to the whole family, except for one of my uncles, his son, also the one who found him. My grandfather stopped taking all of his medications, which was terrible for him because he had hep C, diabetes, and a few other disorders. He was found on the floor in the hallway and he had been, been there for about three days. There was blood everywhere as he was internally bleeding and he began to cough up and throw up blood. After both of my grandparents' deaths, my family took over the house. We renovated everything. We had to put a new carpet in. The old carpet was torn out because my grandfather had hep C and his blood went everywhere. When we first moved in, my mum and I liked to sleep in the living room on the couches because our rooms were being renovated. Also, the cable wasn't set up yet and neither was the internet and we would watch DVDs on the living room TV. My mum and I would usually sleep out there at different times because my mum works graveyard shifts at a vet hospital. However, every time we slept on the couches, something strange would happen. Almost every night at 2.43am, I would wake up terrified, covered in sweat, breathing heavily on the brink of tears. I knew I had woken up from a nightmare every time, but I never remembered them. This happened probably 20 times before I decided I was no longer going to fall asleep in the living room. So I slept in my bedroom, but the only thing that stopped was waking up at the same time every night. The nightmares never stopped. I was constantly haunted by these nightmares. I've always had nightmares, but they never happened as often as they did when I moved into the house. One night, while my mom was off work, she had asked me if I wanted to watch a movie with her in the living room. It was pretty late, and I knew I would fall asleep if I did watch the movie, so I said no. When she asked why, I explained to her, and she kind of looked shocked. She said she had been experiencing the same thing but during the day, and sometimes at night when she was off of work. It was the same time during the day, 2.43pm, and at night it was 2.43am. We were sort of relieved that we had both been experiencing this, but also sort of scared because we had no idea what was going on. One afternoon, while my mom was sleeping out in the living room, she felt someone punch her in her side. She woke up, thinking it was my dad or my brother messing with her. She lifted her head up and said, what's your problem? And nobody was there. She walked all throughout the house and not a single person was there. It couldn't have been one of our dogs. She felt a distinct human hand punching her in the ribs. So basically, my mom decided to never sleep on the couch again. Three years have passed since then, and we never did sleep on the couch during that period. And nothing really bothered us again, except for the nightmares that persisted. My boyfriend, who's been with me for five years, even says that I've had more nightmares in this house than before we moved in. But about a month ago, my dad came home with a huge 4K TV. So of course, being the big movie buffs we are, my mom and I wanted to watch movies there. Now when I watch movies out in the living room late at night, I usually stay up past 2.43 a.m. just in case, and nothing usually happens. Except the other night, at exactly 2.43 a.m., I was awake and my mom had fallen asleep. All of a sudden, I start to hear a whimper and at first I thought it was one of my dogs wanting to go outside. But then I realized it was my mom when the whimper grew louder into a full scream. I woke her up 
and she was very confused and very scared. I told her she was screaming and she said she had a dream where she was laying down next to me on the couch, like she was just then, but I was asleep. She said she was unable to move and was trying to scream because she felt I was in danger, but she couldn't get the words out. Then a shadowy hand grabbed my face. That's when she woke up. My mom and I are the only ones who experienced the nightmare and the specific times that the nightmares happen in the living room. Although when my older brother was crashing on our couch for a while, he claimed to have experienced some weird stuff too. Like the feeling that someone was watching him sleep. We've all experienced things moving on their own. Like this antique kerosene lamp we have on a shelf that just touches the ceiling, that flew off and shattered for no reason. We've actually been losing forks too. I don't know what that means, but forks just go missing all the time and we're down to about three or four forks as opposed to the 10 we used to have. Our TV turns off at random times without anyone touching the remote and we used a warranty to get a new TV and the new TV still does the same thing. It's not a power issue where the TV just loses power or the plug isn't plugged in all the way. It's like the TV screen says powering off and then turns off. We get random scents out of nowhere. My mom usually smells this old soap that smells like a grandmother, where I usually get a smell like something is burning and it gives me a headache. My dad always smells something that he only describes as shit. The smells are unprompted. Usually only one person can smell it. This has been slowly progressing over the course of at least four years. We're not really sure what's going on. I think it's my grandfather not happy that we're here. What do you think? This happened about seven years ago, when I was 13 or 14. I was in my old house in California. It was probably around 1am. I was sitting on my couch watching TV late at night, alone in my living room. There was a big window next to the couch that was about five feet off the ground outside. And the ground outside the window was dirt. Out of nowhere, I heard breathing and footsteps outside the window. And then someone tried to open the window. The window was shaking loudly so loud that it woke up my mother. My mother said that it sounded like the whole house was shaking. I was paralyzed with fear and couldn't move. After a few seconds of the window shaking, the noises just stopped. I didn't hear anyone walk away and I didn't hear the breathing fade. It just abruptly stopped. About three feet from the window was the gate to our backyard. It's the only way to get into the backyard without jumping through our neighbor's yards or jumping over a six foot fence that had a big thick bush the same height as the fence all along it. Also, on our side of the fence were multiple trees and other brushes. Basically, you'd make a lot of noise and have great difficulty getting over the fence. My mom sat in her bedroom trying to listen and my older brother was already awake in his bedroom. Both my parents' bedroom windows and my brother's bedroom window opened to the backyard and on the other side of one of my parents' bedroom wall was the back porch. Right after I had heard these noises, my mother and brother both heard someone walking on the gravel outside their window and someone walking on the porch. My brother said he saw lights outside of his window, like three or four flashlights pointing in random directions outside. My mother woke up my father and he grabbed his gun and went to the sliding glass door that opens to the back porch. And he saw nobody, no lights or anything. My mom grabbed the phone and called the cops. Everyone except for my younger brother came out into the living room where I was. Now, I didn't hear the gate to the backyard open, nor did we hear anyone enter or exit the backyard. We were all intentionally quiet so that we could hear anything that was happening outside. Once everyone was in the living room, stuff got weird. All of a sudden, we heard noises on the roof. These were not footsteps. They weren't animals scurrying. The sounds were loud and bizarre, like a dragging noise. Multiple big objects were being dragged in random directions in our house. One big noise on one side of the house, then another on the other side. It was rapid and fast, like a rhythm. 
they had to have been caused by multiple people because they were so loud and they were on different sides of the roof. Then the noises stopped abruptly. After the noises on the roof stopped, nothing else happened. There was no way for a person to get on the roof unless they brought a ladder or climbed on the fence, then hopped up five feet onto the roof. We didn't hear anybody climb onto the roof either. We waited there for the police who then came and checked out the backyard. After the police did a search, they found absolutely no evidence of an attempted break-in. There were no footprints by the dirt next to the window, no footprints in the gravel outside the windows, no breaks in the bushes by the windows or by the fence, no damage to the window. The police told us what we heard were raccoons, which we all knew was ridiculous. A raccoon can't jump up a five foot wall and shake a window, nor could it make human sounding footprints on the porch or in the backyard, nor could it make the loud heavy noises we heard on the roof. We asked a few of our neighbors the next morning who all said they didn't hear anything, which was strange because all of the noises were incredibly loud. All we had to go off were the noises because all of the windows had blinds closed at the time. This whole time, we didn't hear any voices, nobody talking to each other, but there were definitely multiple people. My parents and I didn't see any lights, but my brother swears he did. To this day, we have no idea what happened or what was there that night. We never experienced anything like that after that night. I don't know if this was just some really good robbers or something else. If anyone has any ideas of what this could have been, that would help a lot. In 1986, a 39-year-old father of two teenage boys named Tom Hawks met a stunningly beautiful woman named Jackie, and they madly fell in love with each other. In 1989, they got married in front of 150 of their closest friends and family, and Jackie moved in with Tom and his sons after the marriage. Jackie had earlier met with an accident, which left her unable to bear kids. So she accepted the boys as her own, and the boys started to accept her as their mom. With time, this beautiful family of four gelled wonderfully, making their house a happy place. When their sons were old enough, they moved out of their house to start their own life, and they felt it was right for the time to enter their perfectly planned retirement. The couple planned to spend their post-retirement lives in a yacht, sailing around the sea. So putting in all their savings, they purchased a yacht. Although this yacht was not luxurious, they loved it dearly and named it Well Deserved. They spent the next two years sailing around the Pacific Ocean and the Gulf of California, cherishing each other's company. When Jackie got the news that one of her sons was expecting a baby, she was elated and excited to have her grandchild in her hands. Thus, the couple felt it was time to return back to the land and be with their son. So in 2004, they decided to sell their yacht and move to Newport Harbor to stay with their son. In the November of the same year, the ad was considered by the Delian couple who finalized the deal in a couple of days. They told this news to their sons and told them they would follow up. With their sons expecting their call any time, they never got a call from their parents for over a couple of days. As this was completely unusual for them, they informed their uncle Jim, who was a retired police chief. When Jim heard about this, he drove to Newport Beach with his friend to see if the couple had actually sold the yacht or if they were still in it. He found well-deserved on the dock and decided to walk into it to see if his brother and his wife were inside. The yacht was completely not in order and the things inside it were a mess. This made Jim conclude that the yacht was sold as Tom and Jackie were an extremely orderly and tidy couple who took really good care of well-deserved. So he left a note to the new owner asking them to contact him as the previous owners went missing. When he was about to leave the area, Jim got a call from a 21-year-old woman named Jennifer Delian, saying that she got his note on the yacht. She confirmed that she and her husband Skylar had purchased the yacht from the Hawks, but just like Jim, they were trying to contact them, but they couldn't. She told them that there were a couple of controls on the boat that she didn't know how to use, and tried reaching out to Tom, but his whereabouts were not known. 
She also told Jim that a few personal belongings of Tom and Jackie were left back in the drawers and she wanted to return them. When Jim asked Jennifer when was the last time she saw them, she told him that it was on the day they sold the yacht. According to Jennifer, Tom and Jackie got the money from her, hopped in their car and drove away. She also told Jim that Jackie told her that their plan was to buy a house in Mexico and settle there. Jim thanked her for her input, asked her to inform him if she gets to know the whereabouts and left. On thinking further, Jim got reminded of a woman named Patricia who managed the finances of Tom and Jackie for the previous two years. While the couple spent their time in the seas, they had poor connectivity, which made it hard for them to pay their bills and taxes. So, they hired Patricia, who was a friend of theirs, to do it for them. When Jim asked her if she knew anything about where they were, she immediately told no. Jim asked her to check if a big sum of money was recently deposited in their accounts, but she told him nothing of that sort had happened. This actually confused both Jim and Patricia, as they couldn't find a reason for Tom and Jackie not depositing half a million dollars in their bank account. Sensing something was off, Jim called the Newport Beach Police and officially reported Tom and Jackie missing. In initial investigations revealed that Skylar Delian, who purchased the yacht from them, was already convicted of armed robbery and they grew suspicious of him. They called him over an investigation and questioned him. Skylar was extremely helpful and he told them that he liked their boat and bought it from the Hawks in front of a notary and one of his friends who acted as a witness. Similar to his wife's statements, he too told the police that the missing couple got the money from them, hopped in their SUV and drove away. When the police asked him about how he got enough money to purchase the yacht, he told them that he was a child star in the Power Rangers and he had saved up the money he gained then. But within moments, he told them that he was sorry for lying and told them that he had previously stolen the money from a drug kingpin, which was the cause for his conviction. When he came from jail, he had to launder the stolen money to make it clean. And to do it, he purchased the yacht. Because of this honesty and cooperation, the police did not book him for money laundering and set him free. They investigated the remaining people who had apparently seen the couple for the last time, but all of their testimonies were similar. This led the investigation to a dead end and the police started spreading missing notices with the picture of Tom's SUV. A couple of days after putting these notices in, the police got a call from a person in Mexico who told them that the SUV in the notice was present in a house on her street. When the police rushed to this place in hopes of finding the couple, they got to know that the SUV was not parked there by Tom or Jackie, but by Skylar himself. The police investigated Skylar and Jennifer once again, but since they didn't break, they decided to investigate Skylar's friend and the notary once again. On persistent investigation, the notary named Kathleen revealed that she did not even know who Tom and Jackie was, and Skylar paid her a huge sum to forge these documents. She told them that she knew nothing of the disappearance. When they investigated Skylar's friend named Alonzo, who acted as a witness, he kept telling Skylar's narrative. But when the police told him that the notary actually confessed and he was caught red-handed and offered him a reduction in his punishment, he opened up. Seeing the advertisement, Skylar approached the Hawks and persuaded them into a sea trial. So, Skylar, Alonzo and another goon named John, whom Skylar had recruited just that day, turned up in front of the Hawks. Tom, who was a long-time probation officer, immediately figured out that they were actually not good people and tried to avoid the sea trial. Seeing that the Hawks were apprehensive about getting on the boat with them, Skylar called up his wife Jennifer. When Jennifer arrived with the baby, Jackie immediately started playing with the baby and the couple became comfortable with the group, which made them agree to the sea trial. When they were about to start, Jennifer got off the boat, saying that the baby was not fond of the sea. A few moments later, Jackie and Tom understood that the group was not there for the boat, but for them. Jackie and Tom were handcuffed, and their eyes and mouths were taped by Skylar and co. 
Skyler forced them to sign the transfer papers, where Jackie intentionally made a mistake on his second name while signing. After getting their signatures, Skyler locked them up in a room and took the boat to the deepest part of the sea. When the boat reached this zone, Skyler brought Tom and Jackie to the back of the boat. He ordered Alonso to bring the anchor from the front of the boat. Hearing his order, Tom and Jackie understood that something wrong was going to happen. Fueled by adrenaline, Tom shook off his restraints and kicked Skyler hard on his groin. However, John jumped on both of them and connected their handcuffs to each other. With John's help, Skyler connected their handcuffs to the chain of the anchor and threw them into the water. As the anchor went down, it pulled the hawks along with it. While they were yanked off the boat, Jackie's head hit so hard on the boat that Alonso heard a clear cracking sound. As their bodies disappeared in the water, Skyler squealed in joy and drove the boat back to the dock. It turned out that this was actually planned by Skyler's wife, Jennifer. The couple was so cold-blooded that without any remorse, they started using the camera that Tom and Jackie used to capture their memories without even deleting the older footage. In the 1920s, there was a farmstead called Hinterkaifeck Farm, which was located in the southern part of Germany. Present in a very rural, isolated and forested area, it was occupied by the Gruber family, made up of Andreas, his wife Casilia, his daughter Victoria, and Victoria's two children, and their living maid. In the winter of 1921, strange things started happening around the property, with the first event being noticed by the living maid. One day, whilst she was cleaning the house, she started hearing tapping sounds from the walls. As she walked towards a nearby wall to check if someone was actually tapping on it, she understood that the tapping was not from the other side of the wall, but within the wall. As she kept focusing on the sound, she started hearing a combination of footsteps and disembodied voices from the attic. She immediately ran to Andreas and told him that someone was there in the attic. Although sceptical, Andreas walked into the attic to check if what his maid told him was true, but he found no one. In fact, the attic was so clean that it was impossible for a human being to have been there previously. The absence of hiding spots in the attic eliminated the possibility of an intruder hiding inside. So for the next few weeks, it became a routine where the maid was waking up from her sleep because of these sounds from the attic and tapping within the walls and telling Andreas the summer's in the attic, only for him to rush to the attic and find no one. With Andreas getting frustrated over time, the maid felt she had gone through enough and quit her job, claiming that the house was haunted. She had been with the family for so long that the family felt as if they were handicapped. A few days after the maid quit, Andreas started hearing the strange sounds from the attic and the tapping within the walls. But now, he found himself on the other side of the glass and his family was not believing him. However, they started hearing these sounds with time and the family started searching around the property for an intruder. As days passed by, whatever was causing these sounds started to turn violent. Random things in the house started to go missing with the house keys being the most common. With just two sets of house keys, them going missing only to reappear later in a completely random spot, turned out into a hassle for the family. One night, one of Andreas' grandchildren suddenly went missing. The family searched the entire property, and since no traces of her were found inside the property, they headed into the close-by forests in search of her. Despite clearing through the forest for a very long time, the kid was nowhere to be seen. When they returned to their house to call the police, they found the kid right next to the house. She looked completely lost and constantly told them that she didn't know how and why she had moved to that place. They covered her up in a blanket, took her into the house and started calming her down. When she was finally calm, they started asking her about how she ended up outside the house. While questioning his granddaughter, Andreas noted that a newspaper that he had never subscribed to was lying on the table. In fact, no one in that area subscribed to this new paper. 
With the strange events continuing, the family found that the lock of a box that held expensive tools was meddled with. The lock had deep cut marks that suggested that someone had tried to hack it off, but failed in their attempt. However, the family were not able to understand how they were not able to hear someone trying to cut through this lock. In the early March of 1922, a day after a heavy snowstorm, Andreas opened the back door of the house to find a trail of footsteps. These footsteps seemed to be walking towards his house, but there were no footsteps that whoever walked towards his house walked back. These footsteps suggested that someone had broken to his house, but not walked back. He checked his property completely, but there were no signs of an intruder. After having been tolerating this for so long, Andreas finally decided to open up about this to his neighbour. His neighbour offered them with a rifle, but he declined their offer. On the 4th of March 1922, a repairman turned up in front of the house of the Grubers, as they had booked an appointment. But despite knocking on the door multiple times, no one opened the door. As the dogs were barking, and he was able to hear the sound of appliances running, he thought that the family was inside the house and walked towards one of the windows in hopes of catching the family's attention. But even then, no one showed up. After circling the house and not getting any attention from the Grubers, he decided to finish off the work he was called for. Once he was done, he headed to the back door of the house, hoping it was not locked, but it was locked as well. Surprised by the oddity, he went to the house of Andreas' his neighbour, told them what he saw, asked them to inform him if they heard anything from the family, and left. The neighbour decided to check out on the Grubers later that day, and went to their house. Similar to the repairman, they found the house locked. As they walked around the house hoping to see a family member, they found that the barn was open. They walked into the barn calling out Andreas's name, but they were greeted by his lifeless body. On 29th of March 1922, four members of the family had apparently walked into the barn one by one, unsuspectingly, as if they were lured by something only to be bludgeoned by a mattock. It appeared as if someone had something lured members of the family one by one, killed them, pulled their body to the corner, covered it in hay, and lured another member to the barn to repeat it. Their corpses indicated that they were not trying to fight back this entity when it hit them to death. Investigators were clueless about why the members walked into the barn without even a bit of suspicion, and literally offered no resistance while being killed. After killing four of the family members this way, this entity went into the house and killed the other two sleeping members in a similar way. Not to forget, two of these victims were actually small children. Although their bodies were discovered only a few days later, investigators figured out that the house was actually being inhabited until the day their bodies were found. The creepy part is that whatever killed this family lived in the family's house, using their bed to sleep and food to eat, while they lay dead in the house for almost five days. To add weight to this fact, the neighbours saw smoke coming out of the chimney of this house during the five days. The cash in the house, however, was still in place, which meant that this was not actually the work of a robber. And since the Grubers were not particularly well liked in the locality, tracing down a person with a motive to kill them became impossible. With over a century passing by, this case still remains obscure. Was the murderer a human or an unhuman? The answer stays a mystery. Two high school sweethearts named Keith and Diane grew up in a small rural town in Ohio and they ended up getting married. Six years after their marriage, the couple found a beautiful house back in their hometown. This house was isolated and it was located inside a forest, but Keith, being a hunter, and Diane, being a fan of forests, loved this home and ended up purchasing it. So Keith, Diane, and their four-year-old daughter, Raven, moved into this house in the woods. Keith was a welder during the day and he attended night school to prepare for an apprenticeship program. So... 
He was not at home during the weeknights, which meant that Diane and Raven were alone at home during the weeknights. The first couple of weeks went completely normal, with Diane getting used to being alone in the house. But she used to hear occasional scampering around the house. Every time she heard this sound, she used to peek out of the window to see what was causing this sound, but she could find nothing relevant. She just thought that it was a small animal that was loitering around and didn't pay much attention to it. One night, when Diane was doing the dishes after putting Raven to sleep, she heard the scampering sound. And just as always, she put her head near the window and peeked through its pane. As she peeked through the window, she noticed two golden eyes staring at her. She immediately concluded that these were the eyes of a dog that was roaming around on their property and decided to deal with it the next day. Once she was done with the dishes, she started cleaning the living room. While cleaning, she decided to see if the dog was still around and she peeked through a window in the living room. This time, she found nothing unusual, but while she was about to pull back her head, she saw the same golden eyes stare at her, which startled her and she fell back. These eyes appeared to be those of a much taller being. Because of the internal reflections, she was not able to see clearly through the window unless she placed her head literally on it. So, she thought she was making stuff up and continued cleaning. While cleaning, she convinced herself thinking that even if those eyes were real, they could have been that of a tall dog. She again decided to see if this tall dog left their property and walked towards the nearest window, which was nothing but the same kitchen window, and peeked through it. As she kept staring at the tree line, which was almost 20 feet away, a human head with golden eyes slowly appeared in front of her, staring at her throughout. She immediately separated herself from the window, and at that exact moment, she started hearing the sound of a vehicle in the driveway. As she sat down on the floor in fear, Keith opened the door. She told everything that happened until then to him, and he rushed out of the house to see what scared his wife. Despite rinsing the entire property, Keith did not even find traces of another person. Thus, he ended up thinking that the loneliness of the house was getting over his wife's mind. He got back into the house and convinced her, saying that it could have been an animal from the woods, and asked her not to worry. A month after this incident, Diane was all alone in the house with Raven yet again. After the previous incident, everything was back to normal again, and she was starting to believe that the eyes she had seen a month before were indeed the eyes of an animal. Yet again, she was in the kitchen looking out through the window right in front of her while doing the dishes. It was then she started noticing a pair of glowing eyes slowly raising up from the edge of the window. She backed up from the window, completely convinced it was an intruder. Instinctively, she ran around the house turning off all the lights to keep herself hidden. After turning off all the other lights, she finally turned off the living room lights. When she turned the lights off and the internal reflections disappeared, she noticed a tall figure with glowing eyes standing right in front of a window before her. Seeing this figure, she immediately called 911, but by the time the police arrived, this figure had already disappeared. As the police went around the house checking for traces and Keith entered the gates of the property, Despite knowing it was wrong, he shouted at Diane for calling the cops. Even the cops confirmed that they found no traces of anyone on their property, and they left their house asking Diane to call them again if anything else happens. Four months later, Keith and Diane had already moved on from the previous incidents, as nothing abnormal had followed. One day, Keith woke up early in the morning and decided to get donuts for the family before they woke up. So, he stepped out of the house, got into his car, and turned it on to idle it for a few minutes, as the night was really cold. Leaving the car on idle, he started adjusting the rearview mirror. While adjusting, he noticed someone standing on the back of his car. He immediately got out of his car and started searching for this stranger all around the place. It was now, he found himself in Diane's shoes. He found no one. However... He found traces all around the house, but they both started from and ended in his own house. 
Despite all this, Keith's instinct told him that the intruder should have fled into the woods. So, he called his friend Dennis, told him about the things happening on his property, and asked him to accompany him into the woods, to which he agreed. As soon as Dennis arrived, he picked up his hunting gun and ventured into the woods in search of the intruder, with Dennis. A few moments into the woods, Keith found the footprints of this intruder, and it was 14 inch long. This intruder was a bipedal creature with long legs. While following these 14 inch long footsteps, they started getting a strange feeling of being followed. Despite its creepiness, they continued following the traces, and it led them to a cabin. They immediately started shouting near the cabin, asking the intruder to come out and face them. But since they didn't get a response, they decided to visit this cabin later with the cops. So they walked out of the woods into a nearby road and called Keith's dad to pick them up. As soon as he arrived at the spot, Keith's dad asked them what they were doing in the middle of the road with guns. They in turn told him about the events that proceeded. The moment they told him about the cabin in the woods, he said to them that he knew to whom it belonged. He told him that the owner of this cabin worked in a nearby tire shop and hearing this, Keith drove the car directly to the tire shop. To not let the intruder know that they knew his identity, they went into the shop disguising themselves as customers in need of tire service. They figured out the person who serviced their tire was indeed the intruder. The person was an old man who was extremely tall with a well-bit frame and his name was George. However, Keith knew that the cops would not believe him because of George's old age. So he decided to go back home, capture George the next time he stalked his house, and then call the cops. But his property was never revisited by this intruder. Three months later, Dennis called Keith and told him that George had passed away. He also told him that this was the right time for them to know what was in the cabin. And even Keith felt the same way. So Dennis picked Keith up from his home and the duo headed to the cabin. On their way, they found a cop's car parked on the road. Luckily, this cop was Dennis's friend and he took them into George's cabin, saying that the cabin had a high degree of weirdness. Once inside the cabin, Keith noted that the cabin looked like it was used by a primitive man. But the creepy zone of the cabin was located behind a large screen. The area near the screen was filled with the stench of dog piss, and behind the screen was a large cell made of thick sheets of steel. This huge metal cage had fresh and old claw marks all over it, and on its farthest wall were cuffs for hands and feet made of thick metal. The orientation of these cuffs suggested that whatever was held in this cell was bipedal and huge. Keith instinctively felt that this unknown creature was the one behind the intrusions in his house. Strangely, Keith never felt stalked after George's death. I lost my job at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. I've worked in private security for years, mostly covering concerts, parades, and the occasional charity event. Needless to say, There wasn't much of any of that in 2020, so I was axed. I had a few backups lined up, but it just didn't pan out. No one was hiring, and there was no opportunity for retraining. I could get started on a new education with my savings, but I figured I'd get a chance to come back to work within a few months anyway. Things took a turn for the worse when my mother was diagnosed with bone cancer. Suddenly, my plan to just sit this pandemic out got turned on its head. She needed all the help she could get, and my savings just wouldn't cover it. I needed at least a part-time job to make ends meet. Something that gave me time to stay at home and take care of her. While my mom got worse, I spent most of my days at the doctor's office. They had to schedule her for surgery immediately, along with the chemo and physical therapy. I never got a good idea of how bad it was. They wouldn't even say 50-50. Then one day... As I was reading the classifieds, a woman approached me. She was in her early 50s and had a very business-like demeanor and short blonde hair. 
She made a terrible first impression, looking like she wanted to rip the paper out of my hands and scold me. But that all fell away the instant she smiled at me. All she had to do was flash those pearly whites, and I could suddenly imagine her standing on a porch with a tray of freshly baked chocolate chip cookies. Excuse me, I couldn't help noticing you were looking through the classifieds, she smiled. Do you mind me asking me what line of work you're in? No, of course, I nodded. Private security, ma'am. Please, Leslie. She held out a hand, but pulled it back. No handshakes in the pandemic. It was bad enough that she wasn't wearing a mask. Leslie Bollin, I asked. Councilwoman Leslie Bollin. That's right, she said, sitting down on a chair across from me. And you are? Emmett Marcus, I said. I work security for many of Councilman Erling's events. Erling? Then you must have a lot of experience. I do. She glanced back down at the classifieds, then back up at me. Erling was quite the character, she said. I bet you have some stories to tell. Not about my clients, ma'am. Leslie gave me a long look. I wasn't flinching. You never talk shit about your clients. Are you looking for a job, Emmett? It all looked great on paper. It was part-time, but almost paid a full salary. Some flexible hours during the weekdays. The weekends would be booked solid. I was told there'd be a lot of downtime, and that I was merely a precaution. The only thing that worried me was that I wasn't given a precise location or even instruction. Two things were clear. I was to bring my own gun, and Councilwoman Bolin wasn't the one in need of protection. A few days later, I was invited to a home. I knew for a fact she had a big family. I'd seen it on the posters around the town back in her campaigning days. Still, as soon as I got to her house, I noticed something was off. The lawn wasn't cut, and there was only one car in the driveway. All the curtains were closed. As I parked my car, I saw Leslie standing in the doorway to greet me. Sorry about the mess, she said as I walked up to her. I'm really, really counting on your discretion here. She said it jokingly, but I had the feeling there was more to it. I just smiled back at her. Of course, Leslie. She showed me inside, and my concerns grew. Stacked takeout boxes littered the living room, and there were at least eight empty wine bottles on the kitchen counter. I found myself blowing away fruit flies every few seconds, and I didn't even want to know what lurked under the carpets. I'll be honest, she said. It's been a rough couple of weeks. I understand, I said, trying to keep a straight face. I'm separating from my husband, she sighed. Not publicly yet, but it's happening. The kids are staying with him. That's rough. Yeah, she nodded, rough. I caught her eyes wandering off down the hall. She started walking, nodding for me to come along. We stopped outside the downstairs bedroom. A dry four-leaf clover hung above the door, some sort of childhood memorabilia. There was a flowery smell coming from the other side of the door, and I could hear a faint whooshing sound. Across the door was also the only new thing in the entire house, a sturdy bolt lock. It was installed to keep someone inside from coming out. That much was obvious. I'll explain it in a second, she said. Just be respectful. Of course. The room was illuminated by nothing but a slit in the window. The room had a single window with some sort of metal sheet screwed across, allowing only a sliver of light inside. The room itself was sparsely decorated. Nothing but a queen-sized bed, a closet, an old mirror, and a bedside table. The whooshing sound was coming from a rotating ceiling fan, and the flowery smell was coming from the floor on the right side of the bed. Dozens of dozens of roses, so dry they were practically mummified. Still, it covered the room in a nice smell, covering up the smell of the one laying in the bed. Someone lying across from the old mirror, able to see themselves all hours of the day. It was a very, very old man. He looked to be well past 90 years old, hairless, withered away, and barely breathing. There were no machines hooked up to him, no medication on the bedside table, just closed eyes, shallow breaths, and practically no muscle left on his body. He stank 
of sweat and ammonia. My dad, Oliver, she said. This is why you're here. I think a nurse might be more appropriate. I'm not sure I can be of much use. I don't need a nurse, said Leslie, locking my eyes to hers. I'm taking care of him. What I need is someone to make sure he and I are safe. Are you expecting trouble? All I need you to do is check on him every 30 minutes or so. Be sure to turn on the light, or you won't see him breathing. I'm sorry, but I need you to answer the question, I insisted. I can't help you if you're not telling me the full story. He gets up sometimes, sighed Leslie. He gets up, and he gets out, and he can get himself hurt. This still sounds like a job for a nurse. Do you want the job or not, Emmett? She was dead serious. I wasn't sure about any of this, but I couldn't see any way I could say no. It seemed simple enough. I just nodded. Good, she smiled. And remember, to keep the door shut when you're not checking in on him. And if he starts knocking, just don't let him out. I'll deal with it when I get home. I looked back on the door bolt. There was no way he was getting out without smashing the door or tearing the metal sheet off the window. And looking at those decrepit arms, I didn't expect that to happen anytime soon. It became clear that Leslie just needed me during her off hours while she was at work. Apparently, she was having some sort of legal spat with a pharmaceutical company and she had to work uncomfortable hours at times. I found it strange that I couldn't find anything about it in the local papers, and even stranger that she refused to talk about it. The only pharmaceutical company that even had a branch nearby had been shut down for decades. That first weekend with the elderly Oliver Bolan was the worst. I was to come in every night from Thursday to Sunday, about five hours at a time. I did exactly as I was told. I put a chair in the hallway and made sure to check the room at least once every 30 minutes. Unbolt the door, turn on the lights, check for breathing. That was it, over and over. I got so bored out of my mind that I started bringing pocketbooks to read on my Saturday shift. I didn't even bother hiding it, and Leslie didn't seem to mind. Hours on end with nothing but a closed to comatose old man and a whooshing ceiling fan drive anyone insane. Then came Sunday afternoon. Leslie had just been gone for a little over an hour, and I was checking on Oliver for the second time of the day. As I turned on the lights, I recoiled. He was sitting up, staring straight ahead into the mirror across the room. Mr. Bolin, I asked, are you okay? He didn't respond, didn't even look at me. He just leaned back into the bed and closed his eyes. There was something unnatural about the way he moved, almost mechanically. I made a note to tell Leslie about it once she got back. As I was leaving the room, I almost forgot to turn the lights off. As I reached the hallway, I turned around, only to see Oliver sitting upright again. This time, he was looking at me. It felt predatory in a way, like he had been caught in the act. I just turned off the lights and saw him lean back into the bed. It was the strangest thing. Even stranger was the roses by the bed. A few of them had turned blue. Leslie came back an hour later than expected and wet as a dog. She was visibly stressed and seemed scared. She just pushed me out the door, mascara running from her eyes, and told me to come in extra the following day. I told her we should talk about Oliver, but she dismissed me. I know, she yelled. Whatever it is, I know. I started coming five days a week, Thursday to Monday. It carried on for a little over a month, and I got pretty used to it. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was going to see him sitting up the next time I opened the door. He didn't, but it felt like there was always a chance. One night, Leslie was particularly late. I found myself dozing off, only to wake up when my book slipped out of my hands and hit the floor. I'd missed one of the 30-minute checkups. I bounced to my feet and hurried to the door. As I put my hand on the door bolt, I stopped. Breathing. Mr. Bolin, I said, are you up? There was a short silence, then a footstep, a big one. 
Not two or several, just one big footstep. Something felt wrong and I put my hand on my gun. I opened the door. There he was, sleeping as always. Had I imagined it? That night seemed to carry on forever. As it was getting closer to two in the morning, Leslie was still nowhere to be found. I tried calling her, but I got nothing. Not on a cell, not on her office phone, nothing. I even thought about calling a husband, but decided against it. Instead, I just tried doing my job for as long as I could. At 2.30, I got up to do another check. As I put my hand on the door, something touched my face. I blew it away, thinking it was another fruit fly, and I noticed something touching my hand. A single, tiny, blue leaf. Looking up above the door, I noticed the dried four-leaf clover had turned completely blue. I opened the door bolt and opened the door, only to have it stop against something. There was something heavy on the other side. Two pushes later, and I realised it was the closet. How the hell did that old man move something that large and heavy without me noticing it? Mr. Bolin, I yelled out. I'm coming in. Step by step, I pushed the door open. I got it open just enough to see that his bed was empty and that all the bedside roses had turned blue. Their leaves were scattered across the floor as if someone had stepped on them. I powered through and shoved the door open. Mr. Bollin was standing in front of the metal sheet that covered the window. There was a loud pop as the corner screw was torn off. Mr. Bollin was just standing there in the dark. The whooshing noise was gone as the ceiling fan had gone quiet. The lights didn't work, and there were traces of glass spread across the bed. Mr. Bollin, I... His arms were to his side. He wasn't pulling on the metal sheet, but it was still moving. He turned around. His face was stretched to the limit as something was coming out of his mouth. It was as thick as my arm and twice as long. A dark, slick surface, like a kind of oil. It dripped onto the floor, leaving blue marks along the way. It was some kind of arm or tentacle. Before I got the chance to speak, the arms split in four. One grabbed the mirror, one grabbed the bed, and the other two stuck to the ceiling. They started swinging forward, holding, holding Oliver Bollen like a macabre puppet. It was so fast, all those things moving towards me. Before I could get my gun out of my harness, he was already at the door. I stumbled backwards. The arms reached through the half-open door only to get stuck by Oliver's frail body. It looked like a snail desperately trying to break free from its shell, or a snake trying to get loose from a bag. Right there in the middle of Oliver Bolland's wide open mouth, I saw something white flashing by. An eye, or a set of teeth. My pulse didn't know what to do, and just started racing. It got so high that I barely even felt it, and I was forgetting to breathe. I got my gun out, safety off, and put myself in a firing position. It was only then that I realised I had no idea what to fire at. What was my target? That moment of hesitation allowed the thing to close in on me. It threw itself at me, tossing Oliver like a ragdoll across the room, knocking over the empty bottles, slipping as it lost its grip on the hallway carpet. I just ducked, and as it went over me, we traded places. It was standing between me and the exit. I dashed upstairs, hearing the smattering of something sticky as the limbs scrambled to regain balance. It just seemed so eager to get to me. Like it was hungry, or playful. Rushing up the stairs, I took a shot. I didn't even know what to aim for, I just wanted it to stay away. I must have hit something. It was a good shot, but nothing happened. Just a large bang. I locked myself in the upstairs bathroom and backed away from the door. I heard some kind of squishy noise outside as tiny tentacles were reaching in from under and over the door. It was going to rip the entire door straight off the hinges. As the wood began to creak, I opened the bathroom window, knocking over decorative soaps and porcelain figurines. I was about to throw myself out when I felt something tugging at my leg. I didn't look back, but the smell of ammonia was overwhelming. 
And in the midst of panic, a voice somewhere deep inside Oliver Bollen. Hello. It tried to pull me back. I held onto the window frame for dear life. As my shoe slipped off, I took my chance. I just fell from the second story window, landing hard on the garage roof. I made a big dent in the steel roof, tumbled off and found myself flat on a gravel path, fresh out of breath. I pulled my shoulder and banged my head, but there was too much adrenaline for me to notice. I stumbled out of my car, threw myself in the driver's seat and turned the key. As the headlights lit up, I saw Oliver Ball in front of my car. He was being held up by at least six appendages, standing like a crab in the middle of the driveway. His eyes were flickering back and forth like he was dreaming. As I put the car in reverse, I noticed I was screaming. I hadn't even noticed that had started. I was just screaming my heart out and it wasn't even a conscious decision. I just had to get away, no matter the cost. I don't know if it chased me or if it just let me leave. I don't know what happened for the rest of that night. I just pushed down on the gas and put as much distance as I could between me and that godforsaken house. The next day, I found myself two towns over. With my left foot bare, I stopped at a gas station and asked to borrow their phone. I must have dropped mine somewhere during the chase, probably when I pulled my gun. I still couldn't get a hold of Leslie, and at that point, I didn't know what to do. The whole night felt surreal, like something that had never really happened. Later that day, as I was driving back home, I heard it on the news. Leslie Bollen had gone missing. I just shut up about the whole thing. The pay Leslie had given me had been a bit hush-hush and under the table, and I didn't want to risk ever coming near that house again for any reason. Besides, what if I'd accidentally shot Mr. Bollen that night? What if I'd just hallucinated? It would be comforting to imagine not having seen what I'd seen, but no, it happened. Not that long afterwards, I heard the reports that Leslie Bollen had been found dead. I think I have an idea of what killed her. I didn't earn much during my time with Leslie Bollen. I've earned enough to scrape by as I look for another job. And I get to enjoy what time I have left with my mom. She's getting progressively worse. I spent most of my days caring for her in my home. And just a few days ago, the strangest thing happened. My aunt came by to visit my mom. We all had some coffee and cake, talk, watch movies and spend the day together. Later that night, as my mom had fallen asleep, I noticed something on her bedside table. My aunt had brought her a vase full of tulips. Beautiful red and golden flowers, her favourite colours. That night, they turned blue. I want to preface this with some facts. I don't suffer from tinnitus or any other sort of hearing impairment. I never had a brain injury and no one in my family suffers from any sort of schizophrenia or hallucination. I'm not under massive stress. I don't suffer from anxiety, depression, or any other kind of debilitating mental health issue. With that out of the way, I want to tell you about my loud dreams. I was coming home from a business trip in Minneapolis when my car broke down. I was towed to a nearby garage in this small town in the middle of nowhere. I had to stay there for a night while they fixed my car. There was an apartment to rent on one of those short-term couch crashing apps and I got a room in a four-room apartment on the outskirts of the city. Nice place, recently renovated. It was a bit weird though. I never actually met the landlord. I just sent the money and found the keys under the welcome mat. That night, I had the strangest dream. I was fully aware that I was sleeping, but I dreamt I was right where I was, sleeping in a bed. I remember looking around the room. After what felt like an eternity, the room opened. Someone was standing in the doorway. I was still aware that I was sleeping, so I knew it wasn't real. Still, the absurdity of it all made me uneasy. This black silhouette just looking at me, a single white eye met my gaze. Then it started to scream. 
It wasn't just an ordinary scream. It was a piercing shriek, like a long, drawn-out electronic feedback loop. Still, it didn't move an inch. That white eye staring at me. I could feel my eardrums vibrating, like standing next to a loudspeaker. I knew it was just a dream, but the sound was so real. It continued for hours, and I couldn't escape. I just stayed there, knowing I was asleep. I tried waking myself up, trying to force my hand to slap myself. Finally, I managed to wake myself up. My ears were still ringing. I've never felt such relief waking from a nightmare before. The next day, my car was ready. I got in and drove off getting out of town as fast as possible. I've never had a dream like that before, so I was having a hard time forgetting about it. It felt like my eye ears were still ringing. I had to stop several times just to get my head straight, and I found myself dozing off whenever I got to a red light. Not that I was tired, but it felt like my body was still trying to understand what's happened. It was also surreal. When I got back home, I explained it all to my wife, Helen. Being a nurse, she did a routine check on me, asking me about my fluid intake, if I'd taken any painkillers, all the usual stuff. She's not the kind of person to get upset or worried for nothing, but this symptom seemed to bother her. Then again, she'd worried a lot lately. Family stuff. After about 20 minutes of checkups, I just had to stop with her a white lie. I'm fine, I said. I'll let you know if it happens again. Can we just go to sleep? Are you sure you're okay? She asked, kissing my cheek. I'm fine, I smiled, getting up from the sofa. I'll take a shower and head to bed. Are you sure it just had one eye? I gave her a concerned glance. What an odd question. That night, I tucked myself in nice and cosy. It had been a long drive, and I was more tired than I realised. It took me nothing but a few seconds to realise I was once again in my dream. Dreaming that I was awake, in my bedroom, with Helen next to me. I could feel my sleeping body. No, I made myself mutter. No, p p please. But there was no arguing. The silhouette stepped into the doorway, looking at me with that one white eye. It tilted its head. Stop, I heard myself whisper. Not again. It understood me. I know it did. But that didn't matter. Once again, it started to scream. That awful, painful feedback loop. A sound so loud, it physically hurt me. Suddenly, I was awake. Helen was gently shaking my head, staring at me. I met her eyes with a smile. The sound was gone. Instant relief. Thanks, I blurted out. Thank you. I heard it, she said. Heard it? What do you mean? I could hear it, she whispered. The sound. I heard it from your ears. The next day, there was no discussion. Helen was adamant that I went to a doctor. My ears were fine, but if I concentrated hard enough, I could still sort of imagine the sound being there. The old doctor I was seeing had trouble understanding my problem. An imagined sound hurting my ears, that made no sense. Still, he humoured me. He put a stethoscope to the side of my head. So what does it sound like, he asked. Like this electronic screech. Like this, I don't know, just this weird sound getting increasingly louder. As I concentrated and tried to remember, the old doctor recoiled. Looking at the stethoscope, he put a hand on my shoulder. Do that again, he said. I replicated the effect six times. By concentrating hard enough, I could hear the sound so loudly that it physically came out of my head. If Helen had seen it, she'd have gotten an aneurysm out of worry. Luckily, she was busy chatting it up with her colleagues in the break room. The old doctor didn't know what to make of it. When he finally put down the stethoscope, he seemed flustered. It's a variation of objective tinnitus, he said, brought on by either stress or head trauma. I've had neither, I insisted. Then it's stress, he said, matter-of-factly. Always is. He got up from his chair and moved over to his computer. He was sloppy, almost showing me the patient record of the one who came in before me. 
I think we're working with a pinched nerve. I'll schedule for further tests in a few days, but I think we should try the simplest, the most obvious solution first. He handed me a prescription for light blood thinners. Could it be that simple? As I stepped out into the hallway, Helen was nowhere to be found. I started looking for the break room, but the entire floor seemed like a labyrinth. Finally, I decided to just call her. I picked up my phone, scrolled down to a smiling face, and then just stopped. I felt my body stopping. Frozen, I just stared at the screen. I started falling face forward into the ground. Was I falling asleep? Right there? Right then? It was an out-of-body experience. My forehead took a nasty hit, but I didn't feel a thing. I could see the back of my head, as if I was lying on top of myself. Down the hallways, draped in black, was the same shadowy silhouette. Behind it was a nurse, moving so slowly, it was like she was running through syrup. The air rippled around her as she slowly noticed me. The black silhouette, on the other hand, didn't need any time at all. This time, I wouldn't just be woken up. I was unconscious. It was easier for me to move now. I dreamt I could stand up and move my arms and legs. It was as if the less conscious I was, the more freedom I had. I just pointed an angry finger at the silhouette. He eyed me with that one glaring white orb. This ends now, I said. This ends... It was moving. It didn't usually move, but now it did. And it was coming for me, fast. The screech exploded out of the shape, deafening me. The same terrible noise, growing louder by the second. This time, I saw the nurse down the hall cover her ears. Was the sound coming out of me so loud that even she could hear it? I didn't have the time to reflect. It was closing in fast. I could move, but the world around me didn't. I couldn't open doors or windows. It all just seemed stuck. And there, moving closer by the second, was the black silhouette with that one white eye. The sound grew louder. I finally found myself stuck in a hallway between two closed doors and the elevators. It was a dead end. The shape got closer. The sound grew louder. The sound grew so loud that my vision started to blur. And as it reached a dark hand towards me, I gasped. That, this was it. This was death. Helen had rolled me over on my back and given me a shot of adrenaline. Air shot into my lungs. The world was still filled with sounds, but that awful screech was gone. Still, the hospital had gone to shit. The fluorescent lights had started to flicker. Half a dozen car alarms were hollering outside. The nurse down the hall was on the floor, crying, her ears bleeding. Me? I just smiled. The sound was gone. Everything was better than that screech. The... The doctor said... Objective tinnitus, I smiled. This is no fucking tinnitus, Helen sighed, leaning her head against my chest. I held her as she cried. The world around us was in ruin. They wanted me to stay overnight for observation, but Helen managed to get me out of there in two hours. They trusted her to take care of me. I had no idea what she had to say to convince that old doctor that blood thinners were useless, but it was clear that I wasn't seeing the bigger picture here. Helen insisted on driving us home, telling me there was no way she'd let me be behind the wheel of a car. I was inclined to agree. You have to tell me, she said. Did something happen on your trip? What do you mean, I asked. You have to tell me. She hit the brakes, causing the car behind us to swerve out of the way, leaning on the horn. Tell me. I know something happened. Of course, she was right. Again, I didn't want to worry her. After her brother had been in a car accident, she had been on the verge of paranoid. It had been horrible. Every night she sat beside me, and every night she seemed just a little bit closer to waking up. The days when she was there, they noticed the activity spiking. Five weeks, she just sat there waiting. We were dating even back then, and I remember driving up there to check on her over and over. I saw the toll it had on her. Then, when her brother finally woke up, he just wasn't the same. Eventually, 
he cut off all contact with the rest of the family. Since then, even the tiniest hint of something being wrong could send Helen spring into paranoia. I don't think I ever told you this, she said as cars passed us by. But I heard something from him too. What do you mean? Sounds, she yelled, coming out of him. Sounds, like with me? She nodded, leaning her head against the steering wheel. Now tell me, please. So I did. It wasn't a big deal, really. I'd been in meetings most of the day, and by nights all I'd drunk was whiskey, cocktails, and coffee. By the time I got back to the hotel room, I threw up. I was so dehydrated that my head was throbbing, but before I could drink any water, I blacked out. It was just for a few moments, but that was it. That's all there was to it. But then again, thinking about it, I could have sworn there was someone standing in the doorway behind me. That's all there was, I said. It was nothing. A few seconds. She just sat there, staring straight ahead at the open road. She didn't look at me. I think it's me, she said. First my brother, now you. It just takes a small lapse. That's all it takes. That makes no sense, I said. What do you mean? Have you listened to me, she said, looking at me with her tear-filled eyes. I mean, really listened? Every day. What are you talking about? No, I mean, really, really listened. She took my face in her hands and leaned forward. Our foreheads touched. It wasn't obvious at first, but after a few seconds, I heard it. Then, hundreds of voices far away, screaming, shouting, terrifying screeches and cackling laughter. It was there, just beneath the surface. All I had to do was listen. They follow me, she whispered. First, they took him. Now, they want you. What do we do? Listen, please. I listened closely. There must have been dozens of them. I could even hear the screech far off in the distance. I was so distracted, I didn't even notice her opening the passenger door or removing my seatbelt. With a swift shove, I fell out of the passenger seat. Helen took off down the road, wheels spinning from a burnout. She went straight past our exit further ahead. I just stood there by the side of the road, dumbfounded. She was gone. I had to adjust my eyes. For a few seconds, I could see them. A parade of silhouettes, all different sizes and shapes, parading down the highway. Some tall, some short, some with shining white teeth. An extra arm. One dragging what looked like the corpse of a man behind him. Another using spears instead of legs. They were barely visible, but just like the sound, I could see them more clearly by concentrating. Suddenly, to the left of me, was the silhouette with the white eye. It could easily touch me, and my heart started beating like a drum. I had to stay awake. If I fainted, it had grabbed me. I had to stay lucid. I tried to count the seconds, but never got past two. I tried not to focus. I didn't want to hear its terrible sound. I closed my eyes, took deep breaths, and tried my best to fight off the panic. I could hear a faint screech coming closer to my ear. I couldn't remember any other sound in the world. My mind blanked. And suddenly, it stopped. A hand stroked my shoulder. Hello, it whispered, and left. The parade disappeared down the highway. Helen just took off, and I haven't seen her since. I think she lured them all away, and if we stay separated, it won't come back. She couldn't risk losing me like she did with her brother. What happened to him anyway? I've been trying to track her down, calling her friends and parents, but no one seems to know where she is. We've talked to the police, and they're looking for the car, but so far, there's nothing. An officer mentioned in passing that she might have gone into the woods. Apparently, that's been a thing lately. Some kind of cult thing. I just wanted to come home. I can't stand going to bed every night thinking that silhouette might have come back for me. I can't sleep knowing that it might someday return. 
I stand at the foot of my bed every night, anxious to lay down. I sometimes get panic attacks. Once, I just curled up in a fetal position in the shower, falling asleep out of raw exhaustion. Helen, if you're reading this, we can figure it out. Whatever happening to us, we can fix it. I know we can. These loud dreams can't go on forever. When I was 10 years old, I had the most vivid nightmare of my life to date. I was at the top of the stairs, saying goodbye to my parents when I sensed something behind me. I turned and saw a huge black shadow figure standing over me. No matter how hard I looked at it, I simply couldn't see a face. I remember calling for my brother, who used to babysit me at the time, and no one came. The figure started to raise its arm over me, and I knew it meant me harm. I screamed out for my brother, and woke up in a cold sweat. I've never in my life been so frightened by something I assumed was inside my own head, but I took some comfort in the fact that it was only a dream. Sometime later, around Christmas time 2003, I recall coming downstairs around 11 to fetch my glass of water. I passed the living room, the door was open, and being a kid, I always stopped to take a glance at the Christmas tree. The room was empty. My parents were upstairs in bed, and I could hear my brother in his room playing video games. I continued to the kitchen and got a drink and headed back up the hall. Again, I stopped to peek at the Christmas tree through the living room door. In the chair by the window, I saw someone sitting there. A tall figure that was completely cast in shadow. Immediately, I was afraid, but thought that perhaps it was my father having a late night cigarette. I called for him and there was no answer. The thing in the chair just sat there completely still. It took a moment, but I eventually realised that I could see the orange glow of the streetlight through whatever was sitting in that chair. I remember thinking I was dreaming, remembering the dream I'd had a few months before, and being a dumb kid, I tried pinching myself, but obviously nothing happened. I remember the adrenaline and the cold chills. I was frightened of this thing, whatever it was, so I bolted for the stairs. From there, I could see into the living room. And I looked once more and saw this shadow thing standing from the chair and moving forward. It looked and moved like a man, except for the fact it was semi-see-through. I remember I took the rest of the stairs at a run and spilled most of my water down myself. I looked in on my brother and he was still there. I stood at the top of the stairs and listened, eventually hearing my father cough from inside his bedroom. I knew then for sure that thing was neither another male in the house. I ended up sharing my brother's room that night. He offered no resistance, seeing that I was in a bit of a state, but I never spoke of what I saw. I guess over time, I just didn't think about this anymore. Maybe I convinced myself that I imagined the whole thing, but this past summer, I had another dream. The first time in over 15 years. It was a waking dream of sorts. I was in bed at about 5 a.m. and what I recall most vividly was the sun streaming through the window and filling the room. I remember flopping my head to the side and staring at my bedroom door, and it was there. This huge shadow figure that was as tall as my bedroom door. I could see the outline of a head, shoulders, a torso, arms, but absolutely no features. Again, just black. And once again, I could see the bedroom door through it, as though it was not entirely solid. I'll never forget the feeling of my heart leaping into my mouth at seeing this thing and I shot up in bed and screamed. I literally screamed the house down. Cue frantic scrabbling and pounding from the next room, and my dad charges in, finding me hyperventilating in bed. What? Dream? I remember who he asked. He was clutching his hunting knife. I agreed and sank back into bed, but after the shock wore off, I started recalling the experiences of year prior. I can't deny it caused discomfort, but I dismissed it as just a dream and even joked in the following days about waking the whole house. It was maybe three weeks later and I was home alone. It was maybe 11 p.m. to midnight. I'd gone to the kitchen for some reason and was standing over the sink. I looked up and caught my reflection in the kitchen window. I had the lights on, it was dark outside and it was clear as day. Behind me, as I was by the sink, was a tall, lanky shadow figure Again, I saw a head, shoulders, arms, 
I have chills right now just recalling this one. It's fresh. I know it was no dream and no far off memory. I turned around and there was absolutely nothing behind me. I glanced back at the window and it was still there reflected behind me. So I ran. I charged through the hall, up the stairs and into my room. My intent was to grab my phone and call someone to come home. I remember so vividly that as I reached for my phone off the vanity, the loudest, deepest growling sound I've ever heard seemed to come from the upstairs hallway outside my room. I know it's not a brave or cool thing to admit, but I dove into the closet at that point and hid. It was about half an hour or more before I felt brave enough to come out and turn the lights on. Although I got comfort when people returned to the house, I couldn't sleep and began thinking of the previous dreams, the figure I'd seen so many years before in the living room. What if this was somehow connected? Years ago, probably about two decades, I had just moved from Calgary, Alberta to a small town in northern Alberta, probably about an hour from the capital, Edmonton. The reason for the move was that my grandpa was sick with cancer and had a stroke. So my mother, younger brother and myself moved the four hours to be with him and my grandma. We're going to move into the basement. I was about six at the time and my younger brother was five. My grandma is upper middle class in Canada, so her house is nice. Probably around 70 years old at the time of this story. Things were sort of odd off the bat. Getting lost in the house, foggy memories I would have, this uncomfortable feeling if I was ever alone in a room. A couple weeks into staying there, I would have restless nights. My younger brother and I shared a room and there were always these shadows that stood beside us. The shadow had an uncanny resemblance to Anubis. Though I wouldn't have had this revelation until much later when I was older and happened upon the image of Anubis. I would have just dismissed these things as imagination and that it was dark. Except my brother had these same experiences. Now that was creepy, but what happened next took the cake in my book. Adjacent to our room was my grandma's cold room. It was connected to the laundry room and is where she put the cat litter. Also in this room was a grand piano. We weren't allowed to touch it or go into the cold room because we could hurt ourselves. One night, while the adults were upstairs and the same with the cat, we were downstairs beside each other, in bed, when we heard piano notes come from the room beside us. Instantly, our breath caught in our throats and we immediately bristled. It only played three notes and never did that again. I'm atheist and don't believe in ghosts, but all of my life experiences I've ever been in, this creeped out. My brother tells the exact same story as well. Ever since that time, all the creepy feelings in that house disappeared. I haven't had another experience like this. Just thought I'd share. Since my mum and dad are divorced, I live in two separate homes at any given time. While my mum tends to find places that are well cared for and in decent condition, my dad often invests in the bottom of the barrel. Back in about third grade or so, my dad and I had moved into a two-story house in a pretty friendly neighborhood. We knew some of the neighbors and all, but the house we had always seemed off. A lot of the time I felt uncomfortable or unsafe. I'd cry a lot when I had to sleep since I felt so vulnerable being in my room alone. So given my fears, I'd often sleep on the couch since our living room was close to the front door. Unfortunately, there was one night when my fear of sleeping in my room was completely abandoned, since I saw something I decided was worse. It didn't look particularly scary, but the vibe it gave was enough to scare me away. Standing with arms slightly raised from its sides stood a completely black figure in the archway of the kitchen. It looked like cardboard cutouts almost, no texture and no visible depth, just black, empty. I was horrified, obviously, so I ran off to my room and ended up sleeping there. The second spirit in the house, though, was never threatening. It always seemed to be a father figure, almost given I've always had strained connections with my dad. The spirit was definitely a man, looking to be in his 20s or early 30s at the latest. He never really gave me a horrible vibe, just the occasional accidental spook when I saw him in reflections. 
He'd look over my shoulder while I played with toys and sit in one of our chairs in the living room where I saw his reflection on our TV. He'd always been so warm and inviting. Part of me really wants to go back to that old house and confront what horrified me, but it'd be hard to explain to my skeptic dad. Recently, some things have made me remember experiences from my childhood. When I was around six, my mom and I moved to Cuenvaca, Mexico. Think heavily forested, it rains heavily half the year. We moved into an old house and a lot of strange things happened. The first big thing was I saw what I believe was an angel. I was standing with my mom, looking at the yard we had just finished cleaning, and by a fountain we had, I saw a blonde angel. It was wearing white robes, but I didn't see wings. They might have been folded back, but it was beautiful and with bright light all around it. I couldn't tell its gender, but it was looking at the fountain with its hand out, as if it was reaching for it. I looked at my mom, and she was looking the opposite way. When I looked back, I just saw the back of the angel's robes as it was walking around the back of the house. I didn't tell anyone, and shortly after, stories of ghost sightings were being heard around the town. A couple weeks later, I was sleeping and I awoke, feeling a bit frightened. I heard a soft voice that sounded like a woman and it said, do you want me to help you? I got freaked out and went under the covers and fell asleep. One afternoon, after waking up from a nap, I opened my eyes to see my mom staring back at me with a pale face. I asked her what was wrong and she just said, Alex, are you okay? And I replied, yes. It wasn't until later she told me I had woken up once before with my eyes bloodshot and that I had begun growling at her and scrunched my hands as if I had claws. Of course, I didn't remember waking up before and my eyes were clear. The last thing I remember is on the TV one morning, there were strange symbols written on the dust of the screen. They looked like words, but in a different language, not like any I've seen, so that was strange. After these events, my mom took me to a lady who tons of people visit every day. She doesn't charge anything, and she's like an oracle, I suppose. My mom asked her about me, and she just said I had a lot of light. Then she took me to a witch, and she did some ritual and lit herbs and chanted some things I don't remember. She had me lay on her lap and told me to close my eyes. She told me to open them on command, and when I did, everything was normal, but there was a green tint to everything like wearing sunglasses with green lenses. Then when I blinked, everything was back to normal. If one saw green, it had a meaning, but I forgot what the lady said. I had this experience probably around seven or eight years ago, but I still recall it in great detail. Myself and some friends had been at a wedding party and decided around 2 or 3 a.m. that we would like to have a wander around so that my friend could smoke a spliff away from the main guests. Being local, I said that I knew of a place a couple of minutes away that would be a nice place to sit and have a couple of beers and a smoke. The place I mention is a very large oak tree in the middle of a nearby field. As it was a full moon and clear sky, it was still fairly light out. As we approached the field, I stopped dead and told everyone to be quiet as I clearly saw a human-like figure by the oak tree. Being so late at night and far from houses, I didn't expect to see anyone around. All my friends told me I was seeing things, and after looking again, I too believed that maybe I had just seen a shadow or something. I stepped over the gate and into the field, but as I got closer to the tree, I then saw this large figure appear to stand up from the ground and stare in our direction. It seemed to be around six or seven feet tall, wearing a long trench coat and large brimmed hat and was all black like a silhouette. This time, my friends had also seen it and as it started to calmly and massively quickly walk towards us, we all sprinted back towards the steps we had first come down. The one time I looked back, I estimate that the figure had gained around twice the distance we covered, running as fast as possible, whilst appearing to walk very calmly and never run. Once we got back to the road, it was clear that it had stopped following us, but we stayed in the area for around an hour to see who it was, and nobody ever came up the stairs. 
I'm convinced this was something supernatural, and was hoping some people on here may be able to shed some light on the matter. This experience I had still frightens me to this day. It frightens me for the reason that I don't know if it really happened or it was just my imagination. It was about three or four years ago. I live in an old neighborhood in Chicago, not the downtown area, but a modest working class area with very old brick homes that mostly have not been updated in a very, very long time. One of the few areas that have not been remodeled or touched in decades. One night a couple of years back, I went to sleep rather early. It was a Saturday night in the summer. Not many people were outside due to the fact that there isn't much of a nightlife in my neighborhood. A few hours passed of pleasant sleep, but then I woke up. There were no loud sounds, nothing out of the ordinary. I just woke up. As I laid in my bed, I got an urge that I've never felt before. I got up, got dressed and went outside. I had no idea what I was doing out there. It almost felt like something was perfectly right about me doing this, but I had no control that I was. When I got to my doorstep, I noticed the street light that was directly in front of my house was dim. I was surprised, so I looked to my right to see if all the street lights were like this. As I looked left down my block, I noticed the street was lowered and a giant tunnel entrance was right in the middle of the street. It was about 10 feet tall and made from brick. It looked incredibly old and rusty. Usually, I'm not a curious person, but it felt right to go in this tunnel. As I walked closer, I noticed a giant pool. It stretched back into the tunnel and made a right turn down a corner. The pool was completely lit up underneath and shined bright. I looked around and didn't see anyone. There were no lights on in any of the houses and it was dead quiet. I decided to venture in. I climbed into the pool that was roughly four feet deep so I could easily walk or swim if I wished to. I decided to walk just so I could see what's ahead. I followed the pool path and after a few minutes of walking, I saw ahead of me an exit. It was exactly like the entrance I came through. I got out of the pool and walked forward out of the tunnel. When I got out of the exit, I looked around and I saw nothing but trees surrounding this old brick road I was standing on. I looked straight ahead where the road went and there was a massive building. It looked almost like a banquet hall, but old. There were streamers and flags all across it almost like an old circus would have. It was completely dark out, except for the lights shining through the windows. I continued down the road and got closer to the building. I slowly went around the side to a bunch of old wooden crates and looked in. There was a massive event going on inside. It looked like a ball or some kind of social for a town. The music was nothing I've ever heard before or since, almost like a classical country mix. Then suddenly, I got that urge again that everything felt right, like I was being controlled. I decided to walk in through this door near the crates. As I entered, everything froze. The music was still going, but every single person froze in their step. All at once, every person in there turned around and was staring at me like I don't belong at all. I'll never forget the blank hollow expressions on their faces, almost a look of caution for me. That exact moment, I felt like I got a grip on reality and what was happening. I backed away slowly, but then I went on a full sprint through the doors and down the road into the tunnel and lunged into the pool and swam all the way back. I quickly got out of the pool and dashed out of the exit. When I, what I saw next almost made me black out. The tunnel was gone. There was nothing there. All the streetlights were back on and houses had lights on. Still feeling uncomfortable, I ran back into my house and sat on my bed. I must have blacked out due to the fatigue and anxiety. The next morning, I woke up and was laying in bed thinking to myself, what a horrible dream. After a few minutes, I decided to get up. That's when I noticed my shoes were on, my clothes were still on, and my bed was soaking wet. I'll never forget that moment. I'm still in shock. I don't know if it was a dream or what.
So it might sound bizarre, but when I was 17, I moved to a different country to attend the school there. The St. Anne de Bellevue was a small little city near Montreal with a giant McGill U campus next to it. Really nothing special about the city, aside from the huge ass lake. So I was extremely lonely and vulnerable at the time. My whole life got turned upside down and added bitchy students and my social anxiety and you got a social kid with depression. Later, around late October, I started to get paranoid that someone is always next to me and following me around. I would walk down the street and feel a burning gaze on me and it would make me turn around and anxiously look around. The haunting feeling never left me. When I was home, I still felt the presence. I started hearing unexplainable noises from upstairs, even though I lived on the last floor. Constant thumping and creaking noises. I felt a presence in the darkest corner of my room, as if something was there and looking at me. The dark figure with no shape or form, but still chilling and feelable. I thought I was getting crazy. Even contacted my aunt, who's a doctor, and asked her, am I going crazy if I'm paranoid 24-7? She said, you might just be under great stress. So I shrugged it off. Fast forward to March, I was already so drained, the feeling never left, and I kept feeling the gaze and the presence. Being Muslim, there were no mosques nearby for me to visit and pray, so I just kept chanting Bismillah to keep myself sane and safe, like my dad always taught. He said, whenever you're scared to talk to God, he'll protect you. So I did. In March, it was the fifth month of being being paranoid and terrified of my own shadow, and I felt extremely suicidal and depressed. I didn't feel the joy of life anymore. Constant issues within myself only made it worse. I somehow managed to get through the last two months of terrible school and made it out. I got back home and was so relieved. But the feeling never left. It only got worse, and I actually started feeling physical touches from it. When I lay down, it laid down on me. Whenever I pass the mirror, I feel I see something there. I kept hearing unexplainable sounds and things moving and creaking. I slept with the Quran next to me every single night. It came to the point where I couldn't even sleep properly, feeling the gaze on me. I kept getting deeper into my depression and felt even more numb than before. I kept seeing it. The shapeless something in the darkest corner. It was dark and scary, radiating terror. I never felt so alone and helpless. One night, I was scrolling through Wikipedia on my computer and then something caught my attention. There was something next to me, staring right at me, and it almost made my heart stop. That's when I decided it needed to stop. Before that, unfortunately, I made a lot of mistakes. I keep saying to myself that it was depression, but now I feel like I was just scared of everything. I resigned from university and went to my grandparents. I stayed at their home for quite some time. I decided that I no longer want to keep it in me, so I told my other aunt about the strange occurrences. Unlike my parents, she trusted me. Being from a country with a strong religion before Islam, we still have people who practice shamanism. My aunt contacted her and told her our situation. And the lady was kind enough to meet us at her apartment. Some people might say she's fake and a charlatan, but she never charged us at anything and saying that it's her duty to help people in need. And I do believe that she has some powers we cannot fathom. She made a ritual, put a candle next to me and instructed me to close my eyes and not to open them until she finished. She proceeded to chant prayers and gently tapped and hit me with her ritual stick made out of animal hoof, leather ropes and wood. The candle went wild. The fire was raging and the smoke went completely black. When she was over, I turned around and saw that more than half a candle was already burned and wax pulled on the plate. She said that I'm followed by a demon that fed off my misery. She said it always latches onto the most miserable and desperate people who are alone and vulnerable and they drive them crazy until the body gives up. She told us to buy a small lead ball or ingot and we did that. Upon returning, she redid the ritual with prayers and fire. She kept praying and chanting. The shaman heated and led until it liquefied and when she was nearing the end of the ritual, she threw hot liquefied lead 
into the footpan full of icy cold water. She did it all standing next to me while I was afraid of lead falling on me and me getting burned. Fortunately, I was spared the burns and pain. The shaman then proceeded to take out the solidified lead out of the water, and when she showed the form of it, it gave me chills. It looked like an ugly face with little horns or something sticking out of it. Out of the safety issues, she never let me take a picture of it. She explained to me what it was and what it needed from me, and then carefully wrapped it in multiple layers of tissues, fabric, and plastic bags. The lady said we should find a place where no one will ever find this thing and dig a hole to seal it in there. So we went to the big dumpster that's been in the city for so long and dug a hole big and deep enough to fit the lead form in. She advised us to bathe in salted water to purify the body and clean the negative energy. And here I am, a couple of years later, completely free of worries and paranoid thoughts. I'd say it was a quick recovery since I was paranoid as a leftover habit. But the first night after the exorcism was the calmest night in the long time. Believe it or not, but I just wanted to share it somewhere and maybe it will be helpful to some people and interesting to others. So my older brother and I were talking tonight and it brought up some old memories of their old haunted farmhouse. Just a little background about us. I met my brother and my two older stepsisters when I was 11 at a county fair my mom took me and my sisters I lived in all my life to. She threw these three other siblings on me all at once and told me my father, sperm donor as I like to call him, had three kids through a previous marriage. While the first weekend I went to stay with them after a few weeks of going to their house as a way to help me bond with them better, my two older sisters I had lived with came with me because they became friends with the other part of the family I'd never met before to help me feel better about staying the night with them. Well, my older brother and I were staying up late bonding for the first time over our love of baseball games on the PS1. So we were playing the PS1 with both doors to his bedroom open just in case the girls wanted to come in and switch out to give one of us a break from playing the game. We started noticing the doors in this old farmhouse closing, so we just thought that the girls were up playing around at 1am. All of a sudden, we heard someone run down the steps at full speed. One of his bedroom doors was right next to the staircase, and we didn't see anyone come down the stairs, so we just brushed it off, thinking maybe we were just hearing things, until the PS1 shut down all by itself. So we turned it back on and went back to playing the game only this time using cheat codes to turn the baseball players' heads into pencil heads. Later on that night, we hear the fridge open and a jar of jelly come crashing against what we thought was the floor. We go into the kitchen and there's glass and jelly all over the wall directly next to the fridge. So we start looking all over, trying to find the culprit. We wound up cleaning up the mess and going back to the room to play our game. Maybe 30 minutes later, we see his basketball in his bedroom start wobbling in a circular motion. Then all of a sudden, stop. And you can hear footsteps running up the stairs. We chased the sound all the way up to the room where all four of our sisters were dead asleep. Still gives me nightmares to this day. Back in January 1995, while driving home on leave, I experienced something straight out of a movie. I was getting ready to be deployed to Gitmo for a joint task force mission and needed my parents to take care of two kittens I had adopted a few months earlier. The drive home would usually take around six to seven hours, but I didn't mind the drive. Anyone who's ever driven through Texas knows that you can drive for quite a while and not see another car on the road. So it's about 9 p.m. and I'm about 15 minutes outside of Seymour, Texas, heading towards Dallas. The two cats that for the most part had taken up residence on my back section by the rear window had been sleeping. It was here that things started to get strange. I noticed about 200 plus meters behind me another vehicle's headlights and thought nothing of it. A few moments later, the cats both started making this moaning noise 
over and over again. I figure they needed to go to the restroom, so I pulled over. So I'm in the middle of nowhere with these two cats freezing because it's January, waiting for them to do their business. After about five minutes in a cigarette, I decided to put them back in the car and give them a little dry food. I began heading back down the road. So 10 minutes go by and I see headlights again behind me, possibly a little closer than before. Both cats jump up to the rear window and start making their noises again. It's here where I realized that the car behind me earlier never passed me while I was stopped. I started to slow down to let the vehicle pass me, but after going over a hill, the headlights vanished and no car ever drove by. I went through another small town and stopped to stretch my legs. It would have been around 10 p.m. now and I wouldn't have much longer to go. I started back on the two lane interstate and was moving along around 70 miles an hour. Sure enough, about 10 minutes out of the town, the lights returned. This time, I said screw it and stepped on the gas. As I approached the bridge, heading into the next town, I blew past a police car. He of course turned around and lit me up. I pulled over and rolled down my window, showed him my driver's license, military ID and badge. He asked me what the hurry was, but seemed distracted while he stood next to my car. He kept looking up at the sky. I told him that for the past hour, I was being followed and that no matter what I did, the vehicle behind me just kept pace. He let me off with a warning and told me to take a right at the flashing stoplight and cut through town. He said that he would stop the next car to come through and check them out. He also mentioned that they were receiving multiple claims from nearby residents of weird lights in the sky and noises. I thanked him and did as he suggested and didn't have any other issues the remainder of my trip home. If anyone else has had a similar incident, I'd love to hear about it. This story takes place in Texas back in the fall of 1994. I was traveling from a small town outside Dallas called Grapevine and was heading to my duty station in Lubbock, Texas. I would never take this route again after what happened this night along I-20. I was traveling alone and had left around 7 p.m. on my road trip across Texas. If you've ever been to Texas, then you know that you can drive for hours and on and still be in Texas. Anyways, this story takes place about 30 minutes outside Abilene and would change my life forever. I decided to stop at a rest stop along the highway to stretch my legs and take a piss. I noticed just a woman in a late 70s model Ford parked in the lot when I got out. I went and did my business, had a smoke, and before I left, I noticed the woman was sitting in her car. So I walked over and knocked on the window, which startled her, and asked if she was okay or needed help. She smiled and said that her tie was flat and that her battery had died while she was waiting here. I asked if she had a spare tire and she said no. I asked if anyone was coming to get her. She said that her daughter was supposed to, but it's been several hours of her waiting. I asked her where she was going and she said Abilene. So I offered to give her a ride if she wanted. She started crying and said that would be wonderful. So we started heading to Abilene and making small talk. I told her I was in the Air Force and heading to Lubbock. She said that was wonderful and hoped that I really enjoyed it. I did notice that she kept looking in the mirror. So I asked if she was okay with me giving her a ride. She smiled and said that everything was fine. She was just happy that someone stopped. So we finally got to her house in a small suburb just outside of town. She thanks me for a ride and hands me a scrap of paper with her home number on it. She asked that I call her when I got to my destination so she can know I made it safely. I thanked her and said I would. But I'd wait until the morning since I knew it would be late when I arrived in Lubbock. I arrived at Reese Air Force Base late that night and stayed on the base hotel. I got checked in and took a shower and went to bed. The next morning, I got up and got dressed for the day and went to find my unit HQ. I didn't even think about the night before. I had so much to do checking squares away. It wouldn't be for another two weeks before I came across that scrap of paper with the number. I felt bad 
that I hadn't kept my promise to call. So I decided to stop what I was doing and give her a call. I called the number and a young woman answered the phone. So I asked for Sandy. The woman on the line said, who? So I apologised and said, maybe it was Sandra. She asked who this was and I gave her my name and explained that I had given her a ride a couple of weeks back. She said that I must be confused and I read the number off the paper in my hand just in case I dialed the wrong number. She said no, I had the correct number, but I couldn't give her mother a ride because she passed away in the early 80s. She was apparently driving home and began having car troubles, so she stopped at a rest stop just outside of town. When she didn't make it home, her father became concerned. It was at that time there was a knock on their door and two state troopers and a local police officer were at the door. She said that a trooper saw the vehicle stopped at the rest stop and stopped to check it out. What he found and what she told me gave me chills. Her mother had been brutally raped and her head was bashed in. Someone had slit her tires and disconnected a battery. The worst part was that she didn't die right away as there were bloody handprints on the window, steering wheel and shifter, like she was trying to leave. The troopers said they didn't have any suspects, but there were times that certain motorcycle clubs would pass through at night. I described the car and what her mother looked like and what she was wearing as best as I could recall. She definitely didn't look old enough to have a daughter my age. Her daughter just started crying and asked that I not call back. A few days later, I received word to report to the squadron commander, so I headed over to the building. When I arrived, my captain called me into his office and began asking questions about where I lived and when I drove in and what route I took. I immediately knew something was wrong. We then went into a briefing room where my CO and a Texas Ranger and state trooper were seated. I introduced myself and took a seat. They began by asking the same questions my captain had previously asked and why I had called the number and spoke with the woman. I explained everything as clearly and in detail as possible. They then finished taking notes and the ranger asked who needed a smoke. So my CO excused himself and the captain, two more officers and myself stepped out back to the smoking area. This was when the ranger informed me that he was the trooper who had found the car back in the early 80s And that was the only reason he came out today, was because of the details I mentioned in my phone call to the daughter. The trooper said that they got calls about a stranded woman every so often, but when they get there, they never find anything. So in closing, be careful who you decide to help, because not everyone is what they seem. So back in the early 90s, we lived in this house attached to the back of a general store. The house and store were pretty old, maybe early 1900s or late 1800s. Out in the store, there was a cellar that originally was used to store goods back in the day. When my parents bought the shop, the cellar collapsed and we couldn't access it anymore. Local historians said the town used to use the cellar as a holding room for the undertakers back in the early 1900s because it was cool. So on to the story. The house and shop were always cold. I never felt alone in that house and I would have been four or five at the time. I distinctly remember waking up one night and an old lady in a yellow dress, who I'd never met, was sitting on the bed opposite mine. I remember hiding under the blankets and calling out for my parents and when they came, the lady was gone. I never spoke to them about it until I was a lot older. My mother also had two encounters with this lady in yellow, which I found out about later on in life. My mother isn't the kind of person who would make up stories for attention or embellish them. She recalled once seeing a lady in yellow standing at the end of our long hallway who watched to do the housework. She stood at the end of the hall for 10 or 15 minutes before disappearing. This was before I'd ever mentioned the lady in yellow sitting on the bed in my room. The other time she had an interaction with the lady in yellow was something she said she would never forget. Another woman, we'll call her Sharon, had begun hanging around our family, trying to court my father. 
I don't know the details of how far she got. My parents ended up divorced anyway. So Sharon had been hanging around, family friend and all that. And one day, my mother confronted her about everything in our lounge room. They argued and my mother asked her to leave, opening the front door and telling her to get out. As Sharon went to leave, she stopped and turned to abuse my mother once more before she left. Now my mum said that as Sharon raised her finger to point at her, there was a massive gust of wind that came from inside the house and a flash of yellow. Next thing she knew, Sharon was laying on the ground outside the house and that something had pushed her over backwards out the door. She said Sharon was as white as a sheet, got up and ran off without saying anything. My mother and I were the only people in the family that ever saw the lady in yellow. My father lived there for years after the divorce and said he never saw anything and that we were making stuff up. My brother never saw anything either. I like to think that my mum and I are connected to the lady somehow. Maybe we have a gift or maybe she only shows herself to some people. For some backstory, my father died in February of this year for reasons that can be simplified as the results of years of debilitating alcohol addiction. I have two older sisters, and out of all of us, I can say for certain that I've had the most difficult relationship with my dad. His alcoholism didn't get really bad until the late 2000s, when a number of compounding factors likely led him to drinking more intensely. The recent loss of his mother, my older sister's growing up and moving out, him getting his position and his job changed due to a very unsatisfying one, and the compounding financial trouble he's always had with regards to my mom's lack of employment benefits. This coincided with the latter half of middle school for me and my entire high school life. So for most of my adolescence, I only knew him as this deeply despondent man who seemed to have nothing to live for. While my sisters were able to grow up and move out, I didn't have such an opportunity and had to bear the brunt of his neglect. Flash forward to September and my mom makes an appointment with a psychic that we've seen before for similar reasons. We want to assess the spiritual state of the family and give us some advice going forward. Me, my mom and my sisters all arrive sequentially to the home where she does her work. The first thing she notices when starting her session is that she felt a very heavy feeling of apology in the room and that whatever was causing this seemingly walked into the room before we even arrived. She distinctly wanted to point out this feeling of apology towards each individual person in the room. This alone wasn't really noteworthy, but then she started being able to bring up details that were pertinent to his death, like a strong aroma of alcohol and seeing blood clotting within someone's body. She was also able to bring up the fact that he was found deceased by my mother, down to the exact detail of being able to sense that she stopped momentarily before opening the door, having a strong instinctual feeling that he was dead. But what really got to me was that in elaborating on this apologetic mood, she sensed that these emotions were directed towards me in particular. She made it a point to emphasize that this feeling of apology was directed towards me the most out of everyone in the room. Even my mom, at this point, the unemotional days I was in for the beginning of the session went away and I nearly broke down sobbing on the floor, but I was able to control myself before that happened. I still don't believe she was 100% accurate with what she was telling me, as it comes with human error and the ambiguousness involved in the messages she receives. But that, I'm most certain that was real. That had to have been my dad in some form and it completely matches the apologetic personality he had in his life. Let me start off by explaining that I have a fear of mirrors. Sure, as kids, my cousins and I would dare each other to go and lock ourselves in a completely dark bathroom and chant Bloody Mary three times in the mirror to see if she would appear and eat our souls out through our eye sockets, as I'm sure many of us kids did. However, that's not where my fear of mirrors started. It was when my mother hung a large golden framed mirror in the hallway 
with my childhood home. It was gifted to her after a family member passed away and quickly became one of her favourite pieces in our home. Myself, on the other hand, absolutely hated it. It gave me the creeps with the way the strange designs on the gold frame formed in malicious looking faces. My mother just laughed at my overactive imagination when I commented to her about it. Then when I would sit to watch TV in our lounge area, I could see the mirror from my peripheral vision. I always felt an angry stare coming from the reflective glass. Most of the time, I brushed this off until the shadows started appearing. At first, this too was only from my peripheral view that I would see what looked like a shadow figure darting across the glass. That changed late one evening when I was watching cartoons from the lounge room couch and I heard my name whispered. I just knew it was coming from the mirror as my heart sank to my stomach and every hair on my body just stood up. I slowly turned to look down the hallway when I caught a glimpse of someone or something glaring at me through the mirror. In a split second of me wanting to run and scream, I watched the mirror suddenly drop and hit the hardwood floor beneath it with a loud thud. I was too shocked to say anything as I heard my mother's rushed footsteps coming down the hall and her gasp when she saw her prized heirloom laying on the floor. What happened? She asked as she knelt to pick it up. Did you do this? She demanded in a tone that she only used when she was truly angry. No, I didn't. There was something there. It just, it just fell. I felt my cheeks burn hot as I stumbled over my words. My mother's tone stayed stern as she explained there was no one else home, but she and I and how she had my father check multiple times to be sure the mirror was securely hung on the wall. Objects do not just jump off walls, she exclaimed as she held the mirror out from her hip to inspect the damage. I was surprised to see the only damage to the mirror was a jagged crack right down the center of the glass. My mother took the large mirror under her arm as best as she could as she walked down the hallway, mumbling about getting it repaired soon. My mother stored the wrench mirror away in a supply closet and I was grounded for the evening for lying about a serious incident. While I was angry for being grounded for something I didn't do, I was more relieved that I'd not have to look in or at that stupid thing for a while. Not long after the incident, my father accepted a promotion at his job which required us to move away from my childhood home. We moved into our new home a couple of towns over and I never saw the mirror again, nor did I dare to ask about it. While my mirror phobia stuck with me, I never had any more actual creepy experiences with mirrors. Well, at least not until three months ago. Life was great three months ago. My husband and I purchased our first home and we had finally settled in. I could not wait to show my mother just how much of her interior decorating skills I inherited. She came down one evening and we had the best time. I gave her the grand tour, then we reminisced over coffee on the enclosed porch. As the sun began to hide behind the mountains, I walked my mother to her vehicle and she had quite a drive home and work early the next morning. I cannot believe I almost forgot, my mother half shouted as she excitedly tore open her backseat driver's side door. Before I could ask what she was talking about, she pulled out a large package that was wrapped in sky blue shiny wrapping paper. There's no way I could not give my baby girl her first housewarming gift. She grinned while rubbing her hands together. Go on, open it, she laughed. I smiled at her as I gripped the beautiful paper and began tearing it to shreds. Just as I was telling my mom this was not necessary, I stopped mid-sentence. My eyes locked on the person staring up at me with a shocked expression. It was as if time had frozen as I realised the person staring back into my soul, looking dumbfounded, was my own reflection. My own reflection encased by an all too familiar creepy golden frame. Do you remember it? Oh, you just loved it as a kid and it's time to pass this beautiful piece on. I heard my mom's voice bring me back into reality. I, it's, uh, yeah, I remember it. 
fumbled over my words. This confusion burned like acid deep into my brain. Did she not remember? How did she forget how much I hated this mirror? Where did she find it? Where was the once very noticeable crack going down the centre? Oh darling, this mirror would be so beautiful in your entryway. You know, right over the side table you showed me. All I could do was smile and force a nod. As confused as I was, I didn't want to hurt my mother's feelings, especially given how excited she was. I'm afraid I've got to run, my mom started as she slid into the driver's seat of a car. But do send me pictures when you get it hung up, okay? Love you bunches, baby girl. I'm so proud of you. With that, she blew me a kiss and was gone. I stood out in the almost completely dark outdoors, completely bewildered. I had no idea what horrific events awaited me in the weeks to come, as I dreadfully carried cursed looking glass into my home. I stood over the stove, frying bacon with my mind reeling, when I heard the front door open and shut. Honey, I'm home, I heard my husband Mark call out. I glanced at the kitchen clock, right at 10pm. Mark had been working late, and that meant late dinners for us. What is this? I heard Mark ask, as I entered the entryway of our home. I saw Mark holding the large mirror in his hands, looking at it with such curiosity. My stomach tightened, and I felt bile rising in the back of my throat. Nothing. Ready to eat? Breakfast for dinner? I said doing my best to seem normal and not like I was going to vomit. Hmm, sure smells good, he grinned. But I know you. What's up? Why dodging questions about the mysterious mirror? I felt my fake smile drop. All evening, I considered what to do with this stupid thing. I had settled on smashing it to pieces in the backyard and burning the shattered remains until my mother texted me, reminding me to send her pictures of it on display in our home. So... It sat on the tile floor, leaned against the side table my mother had mentioned hanging it above. As much as I hated to admit it, she was right. It was the best place for it. Mom, came by, I started nonchalantly. It's a housewarming gift. I shrugged and headed back to the kitchen to place our meals. Your mom couldn't just write your name on a gift tag like a normal person, Mark chuckled. I turned to see him standing in the kitchen, a large creepy mirror in tow. What? I asked, still feeling just as confused as I had since my mother's visit ended. She wrote your name on the mirror with, like, her finger or something. He started looking at the glass with an odd expression. Huh? I said, as I stomped over to see what he was talking about. Just when I thought the knot in my gut couldn't get any bigger, there it was. Carly. Carly written across the mirror in what did appear to be finger smudges. I felt all the blood in my body drain out of me. There was nothing there just a few hours ago. I stared at that thing forever before I brought it in the house. The glass was flawless, not a smudge or spot in sight. Even the aforementioned crack was gone. Babe, you good? You look like you've seen a ghost. Mark's voice brought me out of my trance-like state. The confusion engraved in his expression. You know, Mom, always doing weird stuff like that. I tried to laugh it off. Come on, let's eat, I said as I grabbed our loaded plates and headed to the living room. I heard Mark set the mirror down on the kitchen floor before following behind me. Carrie, what's going on? His voice was serious now. I felt his touch on my shoulder as he turned me to look at him after I set our plates on the coffee table. I felt the tears burn as they started to fall from my eyes. I'm just stressed. I'm trying to work from home and nothing is going right. The internet is still spotty. My boss isn't happy. I've missed two deadlines during this move. It's just stress, I said, as I wiped away the few tears that had escaped. It wasn't that I didn't trust Mark. I truly trusted him with my life. There was just some part of me that was not ready to open up about this whole dilemma. I just couldn't. Not now. Not yet. Mark pulled me into a tight hug. A hug that, before tonight, felt like it could have sold anything. I'll call the internet provider first thing tomorrow, he promised, before giving me a peck on the head. 
After eating and watching a couple episodes of our favourite show, we headed to bed where Mark was out cold before his head hit the pillow. It took me much longer, much longer than usual to sleep. As I drifted off, I could have sworn I heard, Soon, Carly, whispered in my ear by a raspy voice. That night, I dreamt of a dark room. I was cold, alone and scared. The strong smell of sulphur burned my nose and eyes. Help me, cried a strange foreign voice. Help me, Carly. No, I screamed out as I sat up straight in bed. My head was pounding, my heart was racing and I was drenched in sweat. Babe, Mark's groggy voice came over me like a warm blanket. It's okay, it's okay, just a dream, he said as he pulled me into him. My mouth was so dry that it felt like I had sand in my throat. I just need a drink. I managed to croak out as I pulled away and stood on my shaking legs. Mark offered to go down with me, but I shook my head no and headed to the kitchen. I just needed a minute to calm down and a Diet Coke. As I entered the kitchen, my body came to a complete stop when my eyes fell on the mirror. I had forgotten Mark had left it in there on the floor leaned against the cabinets. I slowly approached it. I wanted to kick it, to throw it, anything to get rid of this wicked thing. Instead, my eyes were drawn to the fact my reflection wasn't clear, like a film was over the glass. I felt myself drop to my knees, slowly crawling over to the mirror to get a closer look. My blood ran cold. The entire glass was covered in handprints. I jerked back from the mirror as I heard footsteps approach me from behind. I nearly fell out of my skin when I felt a hand on my shoulder. I shrieked just as I looked up to realise it was Mark. Jeez, Carrie, he yelled as he jumped a bit in response to my scream. What's wrong with you? The mirror, I practically cried. Look, someone touched it. Mark looked over towards the mirror with scowl. How do you know someone touched it? Look at the handprints. They're too small to be yours, and I haven't touched it. Someone is here, Mark. I felt myself starting to cry again. Mark looked back to the mirror and squinted his eyes. What handprints? The ones on the... I felt my sentence trail off as I looked back at the mirror. It couldn't be. The mirror was spotless again. Not a single imperfection in sight. Mark was silent as he looked back down at me. It wasn't until this moment I realised I was still sitting on the kitchen floor. They were here, Mark. And what about my name? It's gone. You saw it too. I wiped it off with my sleeve before I sat it on the floor earlier, Mark said, looking at me in a way I had never seen him look at me before. Almost like he was looking at a complete stranger. I'm sorry. I just had a nightmare and must have psyched myself out, I mumbled as I looked down. I felt absolutely insane. Come on, Mark said, as he reached for my arms to help lift me off the kitchen floor. Let's get you to bed. He swept me up into a fireman's carry. I felt myself relax a bit against him as he carried me. As he turned to head to the bedroom, I couldn't resist the urge to look back at the mirror one last time. I couldn't be sure, but I could have sworn I caught just a glimpse of someone in the mirror. Actually... Not just someone. It looked like my own reflection, staring at me with a blank expression, before vanishing completely. My parents found a two bedroom house with a large kitchen, dining area, living room, TV room, and even a sunroom for a little over a couple hundred a month rent. This was a steal, even back in the early 90s. My mom was pregnant with me and my parents were anxious to get out of the Atani apartment they were living in. Of course, they jumped on this and moved in as quickly as possible. Right away, my mother started experiencing weird phenomena around the house. The cliche feeling like you're being watched, never feeling alone even when you were alone, things you could brush off. This quickly picked up into things that weren't so easy to pass off. Such as one day, not long after moving in, my mom had a couple family members over showing them the house. They were in what was to be my room. 
Since I was not born yet, my closet was pretty empty, and my parents had stored completely emptied boxes into my closet until they could get a truck to haul them away. My closet was a walk-in closet, small one, but still plenty of room to stack two rows of boxes and completely shut the door and the boxes be at least six or seven inches away from the door. As my mom was talking to her visitors in this room, their conversation was completely cut off as the closet door flew open and just about every single one of those boxes came flying out of the closet, scattering all over the floor. Mind you, these were completely empty cardboard boxes. Even if they had somehow managed to fall against the door, there's no way they could have opened the door with such force. My mom told me it was as if someone was in the closet standing behind the rows of boxes and hit them with superhuman strength. My mom said that they were all pale as ghosts, speechless, and pretty much ran out of the room after this. Things continued to escalate after that day. My room never truly was my room due to me being absolutely terrified of it. It appeared that the activity in the house stemmed from my room and it all started with that first encounter. When I was a kid, my family moved into this old house. Some odd but harmless stuff happened, like hearing footsteps on the hardwood floors. But after we were there longer, something similar to my brother's story happened. I was 13, and it had been the last day of school, and I was having a sleepover. It was me, my oldest best friend, and three friends from my school. When it was bedtime, my best friend, let's call her Fran, and one of the three friends, we'll call her Sarah, slept upstairs in my bedroom, and me and the other two slept in a bedroom downstairs. The next morning, Fran and Sarah were wide-eyed as they asked me if I was alright. I told them I was fine, and asked why they were asking like that. They told me that before they could fall asleep, they suddenly heard my parents yelling at me and crying. They said it was all loud and clear. They were sure they had heard me specifically crying on the stairs, but it never happened. Me and the other girls had gone to sleep without incident. Fran and Sarah swore up and down that they were not joking. Then later that summer, Fran was sleeping over, as she frequently did. We were inseparable as kids and we were part of each other's family. We had decided to sleep in the downstairs bedroom. We were lying in bed and talking about whatever when we heard the front door open. We hear my brother Danny and my cousin Jake talking as their door closes. It was odd because they were both living in another state, but we figured they were in town to visit. We hear them come in talking about raising the kitchen as they loudly go up the stairs. We thought nothing of it really and went to sleep. The next morning, we expect to see one or both of them, but we don't. No car in the driveway, no suitcases anywhere. So we ask my mom where they are and she has no idea what we're talking about. They hadn't come, they were in another state. When I was a young boy living in the Philippines, I lived next door to a girl named Amelia. Amelia was about the same age as me. She had a slight build, long, perfectly cut straight black hair that went down to the middle of her back, and skin paler than most Filipino children I knew. I remember asking my mum about her because she looked so different to all the kids I was used to playing with. My mum explained that her fairness was due to her being probably a mestiza of mixed blood and never being allowed to play outside. This explanation made every sense to me, as I realised I only saw her through the curtain of the house's left front window, and never outside, playing with the other kids. The other odd thing about her was that no matter what clothes she was wearing, she always had tied around her neck in a perfect bow, a beautifully kept yellow ribbon, as if her complexion and isolation from other children wasn't enough to make her stand out. No one I knew wore anything like that, especially in the Philippine heat. As my childhood rolled on, I continued to catch glimpses of Amelia staring out at the street, while me and the other neighbourhood kids played. I would try to wave on occasion, but that only seemed to scare her off, and I wouldn't see her again that week. The other children labelled her a multo, 
and said that I would become haunted if I tried to interact with her. I brushed off their comments as my curiosity and sympathy would not let me ignore her existence. On my sixth birthday, I asked my mum if I could bring a piece of cake over to Amelia's house to invite her to come over and play. My mum said that she didn't know her parents and was hesitant to send me over to a stranger's house. I begged and argued that Amelia wasn't a stranger, just a friend who I hadn't been able to speak with yet. Eventually my mum conceded and I was able to make my way to the house next door with a piece of birthday cake. The house itself was an old three-story mansion of Spanish architecture. Each story had two large windows facing the street, and each window was covered with thick grey curtains that did not allow a glimpse to the inside. The garden was barren, and large iron gates prevented any entrance to the sides or the back of the house. The only sign that the house was occupied was the pale-skinned girl with the yellow neck ribbon now standing in front of the curtains of the house's left front window. I waved to announce my presence to her, and before she could disappear, I raised the plate holding the piece of cake high into the air and pointed at it excitedly. She stopped, stared for a moment, then sheepishly pointed to the large iron gate to the left of the window. I approached and realised that the gate had a small hole in it from some of the bars being rusted off. I slowly climbed through, careful not to drop my peace offering, and stood up to see a small hand waving from a partially open window on the side of the house. I walked towards the window and came face to face with the mysterious girl that had been my neighbour all these years. She introduced herself, took the plate from my hands, smiled and disappeared into the house. After that first meeting with Amelia, we became close friends. Every week I brought her a treat, a piece of candy, a cake, an ice block during the hotter days, and every week she would direct me to the small hole in the gate and receive my gift through a small, partially open window on the side of the house. At first she would only say hi and thank you, but as the weeks went on, she began to tell me more about herself and her life. She was an only child to an ill mother and a foreign father. She didn't linger too long on this topic, looking visibly uncomfortable when mentioning her father. She was homeschooled by her mother, who was mostly bedridden and so was able to stay with her all day. When I asked why she wasn't allowed to go outside, she said she had to take care of her mother, which I thought was understandable. However, asking about the ribbon around her neck would end our conversations. I only asked two or three times before realising it was not a topic up for discussion. The friendship went on for the entire year. On the night of the seventh birthday, I came back to Amelia's house, excited to regale her with stories of the outside world and to celebrate one year of our friendship with the same cake I had first given her. However, when I reached the metal gate, I was met with new iron bars and no hole in sight. I doubled back at the window where Amelia would stand and waited a few minutes before knocking gently on it. A moment passed, and then another, and just when I was about to return home, Amelia's slight frame came into view. My heart leaped with excitement, but that moment was short-lived, as I noticed tears rolling down Amelia's pale cheeks. I opened my mouth to ask what was wrong, but she put a finger up to her lips to silence me. Silent and still crying, she reached behind her neck and slowly undid the bow of yellow ribbon. My stomach dropped as I saw the ribbon fall to the ground, revealing a noose of purple bruises, and in the middle of a dark ring, a thick crimson slit drawn across her porcelain neck. I stifled a scream and felt my insides wretch. Amelia's tears were now rolling down her neck into the wound and continuing down her chest crimson red. She opened her mouth as if to apologise for startling me, but all that came out was a gurgled whisper. We both stood there, crying in silence, and before I could react, her mother said thank you and walked through the thick grey curtains out of view. I stood there frozen for a moment, before staggering back to my house in disbelief, crawling into my bed and forcing myself to believe that this was nothing but a vivid, lucid nightmare. I woke up the following morning to the sound of police cars at the front of Amelia's house. The new report stated that Amelia's mother was found dead of natural causes, but that the father had seemingly slit Amelia's throat with a box cutter 
before hanging himself from the third story balcony. The news story read, Years of abuse culminating in a murder-suicide. The house became a crime scene and was inaccessible for about a week. After the police cleared out, I returned to the house to pay my respects to my lost friend. As I approached the left front window, I noticed something lying next to the shattered glass on the floor. It was a perfectly kept yellow lip ribbon. I picked it up and with tears in my eyes said thank you, I'm sorry, and goodbye. My mom died in childbirth. They say it rained that night like the heavens lost an angel. She was cremated and her ashes spread on a favourite lake, as per her wishes. Finally, she melted into the water she loved so much, becoming one with it. I don't have many memories of dad either, just some faint ones of him making me blueberry pancakes, my favourite to this day. Dad increasingly turned to alcohol to nurse his broken heart, but he was a caring father. He died in an accident when I was six. My sweet aunt Lina, dad's sister, took me in. I was a quiet child. Painting was my only solace. I could paint for days continuously without bothering anybody. Soon, I noticed that whenever I painted rain, it actually rained. Aunt Lina jokingly remarked that I have my mom's luck with rain. I loved rain just as she used to. It was my connection to mom. I would stand with my little round face pressed against the window, looking at the clouds gathering till they pour. I would smile at the sky as the silver drops drenched my tiny frame. It felt like a loved one's hug. I missed you, I smiled and whispered. The undulating blob of water jumped like a happy puppy. It fell on my feet in a splash as Aunt Lena opened the back door to call me for lunch. When I asked Aunt Lena about it, she chided me for having an overactive imagination. That's when I knew the rain was different for me. School is a torment for most shy kids. It was tenfold for me. Aunt Lena encouraged me to come out of my shell and make friends after school. That failed spectacularly. I was bullied constantly. I guess kids could sense I was different and treated me with a cruelty that only kids are capable of. For the first time, I had an overwhelming realisation that I didn't belong. Myla, however, was different too. She was sensitive and shy, and we quickly became best friends. She sang beautifully, and her favourite song of all time was Somewhere Over the Rainbow. We were practically inseparable. I didn't even feel the need to paint. I was that happy. All was sunny for a few years, until Myla got diagnosed with aggressive blood cancer. I prayed, I begged, I pleaded, but Myla was fading away in front of me. That final day, I sang to her till she quietly slipped away over the rainbow. She went to heaven, and I went back to my only refuge, my paints. This time when it rained, something had changed. The blob had a head and stumps like a gingerbread man made of water. Time passed, and I, as I grew up, so did he. We went from hopping together in puddles to walking with interlocked arms, basking in each other's company every time it rained. He was my angel. Aunt Lynn had a string of relationships, none of them lasting more than a few months. Most people found it hard to make room in their heart for a bonus kid, especially knowing I wasn't hers. Some even suggested sending me to foster care or at least a boarding school. Aunt Lynn would promptly show them the door. When I would ask her to let me go, she would joke, you're the cheese to my cracker, sweetie. Without you, I'm just hard and salty. Aunt Lena's new boyfriend, Ted, was nice to begin with. He showered her with presents and attention. He even got me gifts, but I was wary of him. He was a little too nice. Then it started with random comments. Were you talking to someone else when I messaged last night? That dress is too hot to just go meet friends. You like that lipstick? It makes you look old. You'd be perfect if you lost a little weight. My once confident Aunt Lena became withdrawn and unsure. I urged her to break it off when he hit her for talking to an ex. He begged for forgiveness and she forgave him till I saw him one night, standing in the dark, just staring at her bedroom window. When she confronted him, 
He said he wanted to make sure she was not meeting her ex. She realized he had been stalking her. This was a red flag she couldn't ignore. She finally broke up with him. He started showing up everywhere, at work, at home, at stores, begging her to reconsider. He threatened every guy she dated, sometimes gatecrashing when they were on a date. He punched a guy who refused to back off. She got a restraining order, but he broke it with impunity, and she had no proof. She was too afraid to even sleep. Every little noise woke her up, so one day, tired of it all, she took enough pills to sleep forever. My world stopped revolving. Neighbours rallied around me for a while, bringing me food, helping me clean, even sleeping over so I didn't feel lonely. But eventually, everyone left. That night, I painted up a storm, literally. I was giving in the finishing touches when I heard a faint click behind me. Ted stood in the doorway with a cocked gun, looking crazed. You're the reason she broke up with me, he snarled. You're the reason she's dead. His face twisted with resentment. Everybody around you dies. His finger pressed the trigger and I felt myself falling back on my bed in slow motion. The bullet had only grazed my arm, but it hurt like hell. Suddenly, I saw a silvery flash and Ted was engulfed in a bubble of water. He gasped in surprise and the water shoved its way in, down his throat. He started flailing and running around, trying to break the bubble. But how can you outrun yourself? He eventually fell on the bedroom floor, thrashing like a fish out of water, till everything was still, even his eyes. The bubble left Ted and took on a familiar human form. My angel approached me with gentle eyes and a fluid motion as I writhed in pain. He caressed my bloody arm and it was healed as if touched by the spring of eternal life. In one night, I saw him kill and heal, and I realised his true potential, and mine. How many years later, as I sip my morning coffee, I see my daughter Eva paint rain for the first time. I see the clouds gather outside. Time for Eva to make a new friend. Cursed with death and blessed with rain, that's the dichotomy of my existence, and also my legacy. It happened, I think, a month ago. Ants were infesting my room, coming from a specific wall that led to the outside. So because of this, I rearranged my room in a strange fashion. But it worked for me, and it was only supposed to be temporary. My room is large and wooden. It sits on the second story, with only two walls leading up the outside. Originally, my bed was facing outwards below a window. But as said prior, I moved it because of the ants. Its new position is in the exact middle of the room. I know, it's kind of unorthodox. I could have just moved it to the walls that don't go to the outside, but I was afraid of them coming through there, too, somehow. I became a bit paranoid, even though there wasn't a need for it. But, whatever. So my bed now sits in the middle of the room, with my bookcase right behind it. And this bookcase is loosely filled with books, knickknacks, and other things but you can see through it to the other side, from both sides. This is where the issue lies. I honestly didn't think much of it. It didn't seem like a problem to me when I first put it there. I couldn't have expected what happened. The first night was fine. I slept well. But as the night started to go, I got less and less sleep. This affected my days and made it really hard to do simple tasks like chores and homework. And it's not like something specific was keeping me up. I just, I couldn't sleep. I was tossing and turning all night and it was miserable. After exactly nine nights, on the 10th night is when it first happened. I'd been tossing and turning like I normally did. It was probably somewhere around 4 a.m. at the time, determined by the hand on the clock that I could barely see from my bed. It was near fucking pitch black in my room. No night lights or anything, because I wouldn't have normally been afraid of the dark. I heard a... shuffling? Sound from behind my bed. Like something was moving my books very slowly, and very silently. At this point, my eyes shot open, and... You know that feeling of absolute terror, when you think you hear something, when nothing is supposed to be making any noise? That was happening. 
I could feel every fucking strand of hair on me stick up because no one else was in my room. We didn't have rats or mice and I definitely didn't let one of the animals in here. For the first few seconds, I didn't move. I was terrified, but I thought that maybe I was hearing things. It was 4am after all, and no sleep can sometimes make you hear or see things. At least, that's what I thought at the moment. I didn't know how sound that logic was, but I was fucking praying it was right. It didn't stop, but I didn't move. Not until there had been at least two minutes of something moving my things around. My breathing was starting to make too much noise, and when I let out a winded, shaky breath, the something stopped. I immediately shot my head up, my entire body in fight or flight. I bolted to my door, opened it, and fucking booked it out of my room. I didn't hear or see anything on my way out, and I didn't want to. I woke my mum up and told her about it. She reminded me of the time in our old house, how I would hear a clicking sound sometimes at night. I tried to tell her this wasn't like this, but she didn't believe me. I mean, I don't believe in ghosts, but I had no idea what the fuck else this could have been. Even though my mum let me sleep beside her, I didn't get much sleep that night. I was just staring at the space next to the bed. I was sweating so badly, my hair was actually drenched. I've never experienced something this terrifying before. Something so unbelievable. The next night, I didn't turn my light off. It gave me a bit of comfort, but I kept checking behind the bookshelf to make sure nothing was there, and I definitely couldn't sleep. I was sweating again, and in hindsight, I probably should have just stayed in my mom's room or pulled an all-nighter. But by that time, I had kind of figured my brain was playing tricks on me. It was just too unrealistic. But it's fucking happened again. And this time, it was worse. I didn't think it could get worse. I swear, I was about to fall asleep. I could feel myself be becoming that kind of weird delusional you get before you sleep. Where you just kind of think of jumbled shit. Maybe that's just me. My eyes kept shutting, and I felt really weak until the light went off. In a fucking instant, my entire mind was on fire and I was fully awake. Before I could even get up, I heard the shuffling start again, this time a bit faster, the movements quicker. I didn't wait to listen further though. I was on my feet, taking a single glimpse to the bookshelf. I saw something that will never leave my fucking mind. Behind the bookshelf was something hunched over. I saw a hand that was discoloured, with long claws on the side of the bookshelf. I couldn't make out a face, or even what it was, but it wasn't human, and it was no creature I'd ever seen. Needless to say, I got the fuck out of there. My body was filled with so much adrenaline, I almost stumbled over my own feet while running out of the room. I screamed to my mom as I ran down the stairs. I told her what I saw, and I didn't want to go check, but I didn't want her to go on her own. So together, we got kitchen knives and flashlights. I still mostly stuck behind her. When we got back to the room, the door was closed and I could see the light on inside. When we entered, nothing was there. Nothing in the room had been changed. No books moved, no knickknacks shifted from their usual spots, no creature. Even the fucking lights were back on, door closed, like I'd never even left the room. But I know I saw something. My brain wasn't playing tricks on me. This was all too real. I never slept in that room again, and I absolutely refused to go back in, even during the daytime, without someone right next to me. After a few sleepless nights in my mom's room, we ended up moving out. And so far, in my new home, everything is perfectly fine. I don't know what that was back there. I don't know why it came there, suddenly, after I moved my bed. But there was certainly something and I'll never forget it. In 1966, the small town of Malenkovsk, Siberia, vanished without a trace. The town wasn't particularly isolated, as it had been just north of Norilsk, a large mining city with a population of around 80,000. 
nor was it disconnected socially, as people would often commute from Malenkovsk to Norilsk for work or to visit relatives, and vice versa. Despite this, its initial disappearance did not make national news, and very few people outside of Norilsk ever found out. For all intents and purposes, Malenkovsk had never existed. And yet, if you were to ask the people of Norilsk about the town, you might just hear another story. One of local investigations and government cover-ups. Or you may hear nothing at all, as not all are liberal with their retelling of the story. I'm Diego Gomez, paranormal investigator, and today I'll explore with you just what happened in the small Siberian town. Malinkovsk was founded in 1965, when Nornikal, the corporation running the nickel plant in Norilsk, had wanted to expand beyond the city to find other precious metals in the Arctic Circle, pushed on by the economic boom brought in by the Soviet Union. When asked about Malinkovsk, however, Nornikel will insist they went to Astoshkoy Field, where they found the world's largest deposit of copper nickel ores instead, and that Malinkovsk never existed. But as we did our digging, and today I have for you an interview with the previous head of police in Norlisk, who served during the events that transpired in Malenkovsk. Interview with Dmitry Petrov, head of the Norlisk Police Department. Dmitry coughs, and the sound of creaking leather is heard as he sits down in the provided armchair, clearing his throat. Diego, I hope you found your way all right. The office tends to give people trouble. Dimitri, it was no trouble. In our emails before, you said that something happened, that the town didn't vanish quietly. Can you tell me about that? Dimitri is heard taking a breath, a shaky and slow inhale before letting it out in one long exhale. We had first heard about it, us at the police station, when the calls started coming in. Malinkovsk didn't have a proper police force yet, so we took the calls from both communities and had two or three officers stationed in or near Malenkovsk to respond to them. Why didn't Malenkovsk have a police force? It was a uh, bureaucratic stuff, I guess. Nornikal built the town, but it was technically just an extension of our town. It wasn't very far, around 32 kilometers or uh, 20 miles. I see. So you started getting calls about the town disappearing? No, no. The calls were about the mine. The mine was smoking. They thought there was a fire. What were they mining? It was a mess. Platinum, copper, nickel. I didn't know a whole lot about it, but they had found some stuff worth digging for and set up a camp. And then a few buildings, and eventually a town. It went real fast. I think they had 500 people living there in the first six months. And by the end, well, there was around nine, I suppose. Hundred? Yeah, 900. But anyways, they called about the mine during the early afternoon. I don't remember the time exactly, but the mine, it had smoke coming from it. So we dispatched our officers, and they started getting buckets and water. NFD was still in Norlisk, so the fire truck had to go to the 32 kilometers to Malenkolovsk. We didn't hear or think things would get so out of hand. There was nothing to burn. The mine was almost a kilometer outside of the town. No trees, but... Dimitri pauses, the only sound coming through the recording being his shaky breathing and what sounds like a foot tapping. The silence goes on for 19 seconds. Dimitri? I'm sorry, sorry. I can see it in my head again. It's not so easy. I understand. Do you need a break? No, I'm all right. When I'd been at the office, we didn't get much crime. Mostly small things like disagreements gone out of hand. A bar fight or two on weekends. This was a Tuesday. Everything was alright. About an hour after NFD dispatched a truck to the mine, things had gotten pretty quiet. We were getting worried because we hadn't heard back from our boys in Malenkolovsk. They weren't answering the radio either, so we were gearing up to go down there. We were going to take another truck too. Before we left, all at once, the phone started going off. Just back to back to back calls. Most of them weren't very clear. A lot of static coming over the lines, but they were talking about smoke. Smoke everywhere. They said they were stuck inside. They heard screaming and couldn't leave. 
So we took the last two trucks and a car and hauled ass down there. Six more of us and five firemen. The town caught fire. That's what we were thinking. Even from Norlisk, we were starting to see the smoke. The trucks couldn't go too fast on the dirt roads, maybe 30 kilometers per hour. We didn't arrive on scene until about half an hour after we left. A storm had started to whip up, blowing snow into the air so bad, we couldn't see more than five meters in front of us. There wasn't any mention of a storm in the forecast that morning. I remember that specifically. I thought the anchors lazy bastards. By the time we got there, smoke was everywhere, mixing with the snow dust in the air to turn everything a foggy grey. When we finally got eyes on the town, smoke had wrapped around the buildings like a snake covering them and making it impossible to tell what was burning and what wasn't. They burned even during the storm? Yes, we didn't have time to stop and ponder it. We had work to do, though in hindsight, the fire wasn't all that unusual. The smoke was strange. It wasn't rising into the sky. It stayed low like a fog. It was almost like it was heavy and couldn't get off the ground. We thought we could hear people from outside town Voices carrying to us through the whipping wind, though just barely. We, we thought they were screaming. Dimitri is noted to have been shaking at this point, face pale and eyes wide. He was slowly becoming less and less legible over the recording. Do you need a break? No, I can, uh, I can keep going. How about we take a minute to break? I've got coffee on the kettle and Clara should be done with dinner by now. Let's have a bite to eat. Take a moment to prepare. Okay. The recording cuts out. In 1989, a team of Soviet engineers, led by an individual named Mr. Azakov, began drilling for oil somewhere within Siberia. They drilled a hole of 14.4 kilometers, or 9 miles beneath the surface, before breaking into a cavity deep in the earth. One not filled with oil, as they had previously expected. Intrigued by this discovery, they lowered down sensory equipment in an attempt to study this cavity. They found, in the brief moments before their equipment was burned to ash, that the temperature inside the cavity exceeded 1000 degrees Celsius, or 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. They also claimed to have heard the voices of the damned, screaming in agony and torment. Shortly after, the project was abandoned and all data was either seized by the government or destroyed. This incident has since been dubbed the well to hell. Dimitri. Your wife. She makes a wonderful meatloaf. Thank you. Of course, you're our guest. Dimitri clears his throat, passing his hands on his knees and pausing for a few moments. So, where did I leave off? You had just got into town and told me about the smoke and snow making it hard to see. And you mentioned screaming. Hmm, I remember now. This was mostly the firefighters' show. We were there for support and to make people out of the city. The firefighters needed to find out what was burning and what wasn't, so they could try to set up a control line, stop the fire from moving anyone. When we went in, it was a bit easier to tell. I'd say around half the buildings were burning. NFD started working right away, a few of us digging up trenches in the snow between buildings to stop the fire from spreading to them while they got to work spraying down the blazers that seemed the most out of control, or likely to spread. The other officers and I had been wearing respirators. We often had to work with firefighters in Norlisk because of how few there were, so we already knew that we were doing and had gear that fit. Three of us started clearing homes, searching for survivors, but there was... nobody. Every building we went to, we found no one. Normally, that might be considered good. But we saw no one in the streets. No one anywhere. A thousand people in this town, and we didn't see or hear a single one. What about the screaming you heard before? Gone. The only sounds then were the fires roaring, the wood crackling, and the wind whistling as it whipped past us, blowing snow and smoke into our faces. Could they have died in the fires? The idea that every person in that city, or even a majority of them, had died in the fires despite us having received so many calls from them under an hour ago, seemed unlikely. We had thought they might have moved out of town in a group, stuck together and been waiting somewhere for us to find them, 
So Maxim and I split off and started searching the streets while the rest kept working. Walking through a burning city with low visibility? We knew what we were doing. What signs meant the fire was too dangerous ahead? When to fall back and when to press forwards? At that point, our biggest worry was that the people were trapped somewhere by the fire. We went a few blocks without a single sign of life. When things started to get strange. More so than they already had? Yes. We had started to hear something in the wind, almost like it was carrying whispers to us, incoherent, but very much real. We followed them, the best that we could with the storm getting worse and worse, and soon we found ourselves at the edge of town. By now, the sound was louder. It was singing. We could hear hundreds of voices singing, some in harmony, some not, but all seemed to be singing the same song. I had gotten excited, glad we found them, but Maxim, he was not so sure. Why are they at the mine? The fire started there, he had said. But I told them it was fine. They were singing after all. No doubt to keep the children calm and make it easier to find them. What were they singing? I don't know. It was a joyful tune, but not one I recognised, and we were too far away to hear the words. We couldn't go to them, not on foot. Even with the dirt road, walking through a blizzard like that in an open field, you can get lost easily. We went back for the car. It took us maybe ten minutes. We told the others what we had found, and they wanted one of us to go back with the car. We didn't have personal radios back then, just the ones in vehicles, and they wanted to know what was going on, and how soon a rescue operation needed to happen. We had hoped everyone would sit tight until they got the fires under control, but their safety was our priority. I was chosen to go back to them. Dimitri again sounds unwell, and he takes a moment to collect himself before continuing. They were gone when I got there. What? The people at the mine. They were gone. I drove to the mine, and there was nobody there. I saw cars and thought they might have been inside, but mine? It spat smoke like the earth was vomiting its heat and rage into the sky. So forceful that standing at the entrance made me sway like a child in a storm. Even with my respirator, it stank of burning meat and sulphur. I had to resist the urge to rip off my mask and empty my stomach on the snow. I was preparing to return to the radio, thinking about how I would tell them what I found. What I could say to explain. And I heard it. Coming from that mine, bouncing off the walls and ringing through the air. I heard singing. Dimitri raises a shaking hand to his brow, wiping the sweat from it as he speaks. I do not know the words. I wasn't good with the language. I didn't recognize it. I'm sorry. But they sang that happy tune again. First one voice, but many, many more followed it. It was so loud I had to hold my ears. It made my head pound. I knew I should have left. Should have told the others what happened and waited for help. But... I needed to know. I needed to know why our officers would go down this place without telling us. Why the townspeople were in a smoking, stinking mine. I fought my way through the burning smoke and relentless singing, walking into the mine. My respirator protected me from the smoke, but not the growing smells within. It stank of charcoal, of burning methane and stomach-turning copper, and more than once I had to stop and focus on my breathing to stop from ripping my mask off and vomiting. It was hot too. The heat was unyielding. The smoke blowing it into me and at a few points, I turned my back to it to give my front rest. The floor was wet and sticky. I couldn't see my own two feet, but something coated the floor that clung to my boots as I walked. I made it maybe 25 meters. I couldn't see a damn thing. The smoke was everywhere and the singing began to change. The singing was still a cheerful tune but the voices singing it were not happy anymore. They screamed in agony as they sang, each word sounded like it would rip from their throats and silence their song. I couldn't bear it anymore. I ran out of that cave and back to the car. I could hardly explain what had happened to my other officers. They didn't understand, they didn't believe me. Dimitri is gripping the mug of coffee tightly. Knuckles are pale white as he stares down at it intently for several moments. We didn't save the town. 
the fires were under control, and then they weren't. Like they had decided it was time. The whole town burnt down, and we never found a single body. The rumour is, when the Soviet armed forces came down and blocked off the roads, set up camps around the old town, they pulled bodies out of the mine. Mangled, burnt bodies. Practically just bones. Why didn't this ever make the news? We weren't allowed to speak about it. People started to disappear from the town. Most knew it was the armed forces, but knowing what it was didn't make it any better. So, we stayed quiet. Why didn't anyone try to leave? Spread the word elsewhere? You've heard the city is locked down, yes? No real roads, no trains. The only way out is through the airport, and you need permission to enter and leave. That became official in 2001. But this has been this way since Malinkolovsk. Nobody leaves without permission, and if you were there for Malinkolovsk, you don't get permission. How did you get out? I snuck to the port 40 miles away and stowed away on a ship. Eventually, I made it here. Alright, well, thank you for your time. I'll make sure this gets out. Is there anything you want to say before this ends? Don't go to Siberia. Ha! You don't have to tell me twice. The recording cuts out again. I did go to Siberia though, and after some convincing, I was let into Norlisk for some artistic photography, and a lie about writing an article about the better parts of life in Norlisk. There wasn't a road, but we did manage to find Malinkovsk, or the place it should have been. There was no town, no burnt rubble hindered under the snow, and no military camp or anything of the sort. But we did find a mine. The first thing I felt when I hit the water was fear. It had been months since I'd last dived. Hell, I even got nervous when I took showers. But this guilt... This pain in my chest, I had to go back. I started to swim, arms cutting through the water and pulling me forward towards the submersible. I climbed atop it, taking the hand of Harry, who pulled me out of the water and gave me a stern look. There. Have you warmed up enough? he asked, irritated that I'd needed to splash around in the water before getting started, but understanding why. I nodded, taking a deep breath through my nose and sighing. I'm ready. We climbed inside, where the rest of the crew waited. There was Robert, my previous captain, an older man in his late forties, his grey beard and short grey hair almost making a box around his face. He was sitting next to Irene, a short, stout woman with black hair and green eyes. I took my seat next to Robert, and Harry sat at the helm, starting to take us down. When Robert had heard I wanted to go back down, he called me insane. He hadn't seen what took Brett, what attacked us down there, but he had heard enough over the radio to know we should leave the island and go far, far away. Turns out, I wasn't the only one keen on going back down, however. Shortly after our conversation, we were met outside our office by a few men in military garbs. They greeted us as Lieutenant Harry and Lieutenant Commander Johnson. We're here on behalf of the NOAA, they had said, and I saw Robert's face twist with rage. He took a step forward, pointing at Johnson's chest and shouting in his face. Two months! It's been two whole months I was trying to get a hold of you. What the fuck kind of games are you playing at? Anne pulled on him, trying to pry him away from the men. Johnson wiped the spit from his face and answered calmly. We weren't allowed to make contact. Not until we had more information. He barely got the sentence out before Robert was shouting again. What information? What was that? What happened to that boy you sent to die? Johnson removed his hat, putting it to his chest and lowering his eyes. What happened to Brett was... We couldn't have known. The HOV jostled in the water, shaking me from my thoughts. The HOV we sat in was around 60 feet long. It was cramped inside and we didn't really have room to travel, as the inhabitable part of the HOV submersible was around 15 feet long. It had a control console at the front, with chairs for each of us behind it. Ahead of the console was our window, with lights on either side, shining out into the emptiness ahead. I looked out into the dark, gazing into it and waiting. 
half expecting something to glide out of the darkness and swallow us whole. What's our depth? I asked, shaking the thought from my head. Robber looked over the console in front of him before reading out 1400 meters. We were about halfway to the entrance of the trench, and I let out a shaky breath, which caused Irene to turn her head to look at me. You going to be able to handle this? She asked, and I gave her a solemn nod. We need you to go back into the trench again, Johnson had said to me, locking eyes and trying to read my reaction. He seemed surprised by my answer, eyes going a little wide when I agreed. I thought that would take more convincing, he joked, sitting back and letting out a breath. I could feel Robert wanting to speak, trying to come up with something to say, but I decided to continue. You're going to have to pay us a lot. But yeah, I get the feeling you wouldn't be here if it wasn't important. And you're sending some of your guys with us this time. I'm not going down there to die. And I want to know you're invested in my safety. A grin crossed his lips and he nodded before replying calmly. Harry will be going with you, along with one of our navigation officers. You're going in a sub this time. You shouldn't even need to get your toes wet if we can help it, he'd said. And Robert finally found his words. Why? What could you possibly want down there? Johnson's face turned deadly serious, his voice low and firm. We're going to blow it up. 2,700 meters, time to get to work, Irene called, and I shook the days from my mind. We were all staring out the window now, watching the bubbles rise past us. Harry was next to speak. His voice sounded concerned for the first time since we met. Shouldn't we be seeing some by now? They've been all over the archipelago. I figured we should see them pouring out of here in swarms. We all stared for a few moments longer, before he turned and nudged me with his elbow. His voice irritated now. Well, you're the fucking expert here. Answer me. I glared at him, but Robert spoke for me, standing up as he did. You saw them once. You've got a head. Fucking use it. There are no experts. Not for something like this. Harry stared daggers into him for a moment, but seemed to back down, turning his head back to the console as he navigated us deeper into the trench. I nodded my appreciation at Robert, and he sat back down. The logistics of dropping a bomb into a mild wide opening in the ocean floor aren't as complicated as you might think. In fact, there should be no repercussions at all. The water pressure would compress the explosion and absorb most of its energy, and while the gases would bubble up to the surface, their harm to the environment would be minimal. Due to the nature of this threat, the damage to sea life wasn't a concern. However, this was a double-edged sword. Unless we were dropping something nuclear, the explosion wouldn't be big enough to vaporize everything within the trench. And while certainly doable, there was worry that what radiation made it into the atmosphere would rain down on the Galapagos Islands. And while the radiation left in the ocean would dilute into the water after about a day, it was possible that it could still cause some harm to the islands and their inhabitants. This meant we needed a smaller bomb and someone to put it in the perfect spot. A little thump was heard, as what looked like a squid bumped into the glass of our submersible. We all watched as it tried to keep pace with us, bumping into the glass again and again. That's odd, said Irene, leaning forward and squinting at the strangely behaving squid. It slowly spun around, and Harry gagged at the sight of it. While the front of it had been untouched, the back was swollen and pulsing, covered in dozens of small holes, all clustered together. Small worms poked out of the holes, poking at the glass before retreating back inside. They were long and red, and had disc-like growths for heads. After a few more prods, it seemed to lose interest and drift away. We saw another, this one a stingray, its body missing its fins as they had been completely consumed by the worms. And as it floated past, we saw more and more, dozens of them drifting up and past us. Harry was taking deep breaths, and Irene put a hand on his shoulder, her voice somewhat soothing, though just barely. You okay? She asked him, and he shook his head for a moment, before regaining his composure and saying, Yeah, that was fucking disgusting. And that, we all agreed on. Why couldn't you just drop a bomb into the trench and be done with it? What good would be done by having us go down there? Robert demanded. His frustration began to grow again. 
We aren't nuking the trench. This is targeted bombing. And we need someone who has been down there before to help us pinpoint exactly what we're looking for. And what exactly are you looking for? I asked, my stomach twisting with anxiety. We believe there is some sort of source, like a nesting ground or a queen that these things are coming from. We believe if we blow it up, we'll be able to contain the threat. I began to reply that day in my head, walking through everything I'd seen in my mind's eye as Robert spoke up again. He barely went in. He can't help. I cut him off, eyes going wide as one image came to the forefront of my mind. There was a whale. It had worms in it, hundreds, and they were big. Bigger than you'd believe. Big enough to yank Brett inside like he was a rag doll. And the whale? It was alive. They didn't kill it. The men both looked at each other and then back at me before answering. Yeah, that could be it. The sub was drifting to a stop now and I stood up, looking out through the glass. The others rose as well, each of us moving over to the glass to get a better look. Ahead of us, we saw glowing yellow lights, dim and faint, but there nonetheless. What's our depth? Robert asked as he reached out and put a hand on the glass. Irene moved back to her seat and read the numbers off the gauge, causing us all to grow quiet again. 7,400 metres. 74 metres below the surface of the ocean, nearly as deep as Mount Everest. Is that the bottom? Irene asked, and Harry filled it with the controls for a moment. Let's find out. And with the press of a button, the sub launched a flare into the distance. It flung out into the water, farther and farther away from us and closer to the dim lights in the distance. After a few seconds, it ignited properly, starting to drift off down towards the floor, and I felt my stomach begin to twist and turn. The dim yellow lights we saw in the distance were illuminated now. At the bed of the trench was a field of writhing cysts, each one filled with a sickly yellow liquid that glowed softly against the dark ocean water, pulsing slowly with light and movement. They looked like the eyes of a fly, each one a single big mound with hundreds of small bubbles on its surface, each wriggling and twitching with life. From time to time, some of the Sith's small pustules would pop, releasing small waves of the worms and leaking a thick, viscous fluid into the water that sank to the bottom and started to clump together, slowly forming a new, smaller cyst. Good God, Robert said taking a step away from the glass and resting a hand on the wall next to him, looking close to losing his lunch. And to be fair, we all were at that point. Up one nest, Harry said, but no will in sight. Unfortunately, what greeted us next was far worse than the whale. We couldn't see it. Not all of it, at least. It was too dark and too big. We caught sight of it when it began to investigate the flare sinking down towards the nest. At first, it was just a dark shape in the water, slowly moving around the flare. But as it got closer, we began to see more of its long, dark form. Harry fired off a second flare, and as it showed closer to the thing, we got a much better look. Circling around the mound of cysts was a massive, pale black, eel-like creature. Its body was slender and slimy, with a long white fin on its top and bottom, running the length of its body and two more regular fins on either side that waved and twisted as it turned through the water. We could feel the water being displaced by its powerful movements from there, jostling our sub, and it slowly turned, revealing its face to us. It was a gaping maw, round and lined with rows and rows of teeth. It dripped a sickly yellow liquid, and as the creature slowly lowered its head to the ocean floor, its body writhed and convulsed, and we saw a round shape push up its body, like how an egg can be seen travelling down the belly of a snake. When the shape reached the mouth, the creature vomited a large clump of the yellow snot onto the ocean floor, which wriggled and formed into another cyst. We need to go. We can't blow that thing up. We need, hell, missiles or something, Irene said. All of our eyes locked onto the shape, floating around the ocean like a ribbon caught in a current. Harry nodded slowly and began to take us back up. As he did, however, the thing seemed to lose interest in the dimming flares and catch sight of us. 
the last thing we saw before the flares died out was its massive form, waving back and forth in the water like a snake as it made its approach. We sat frozen, too afraid to move or speak, and Irene's hand slowly reached out and pressed a button, shutting off the lights. After a few more seconds had passed, Robert spoke up. Should we fire another flare? Maybe it'll go after it and we can get away. Harry's hand hovered over the control to launch the flare, shaking. He slowly reached down and pressed it. We all watched the flare sail out into the water like a dim shooting star before erupting into light. Just 30 meters in front of us, headed straight for us with its gaping mouth stretching open wider somehow, was the Queen. The submersible descended into chaos as it made contact, smashing into us and latching onto the window like a suction cup, knocking all of us out of our seats. The sub was designed to withstand the immense pressure of the ocean depths, but not this, and the glass began to crack and seep water into the helm. We were halfway inside of its mouth, and its curved teeth gripped the sub, pulling us deeper as they cut small white lines into the glass. Harry was the first one up, firing flares as fast as he could, and three more shot off, landing on the creature. It didn't seem to appreciate this and let go, flinging the submersible through the water. Harry was yanking on the sticks now, steadying the thing and driving it away as fast as he could, but it wasn't exactly designed for speed, and we were sure that thing would be right behind us, coming back to finish the job. We couldn't run. We were trapped in this metal coffin at the bottom of the ocean, 15 feet of air in miles of water. I was gripping the chair with all my strength, knocking turning white as I did, and Irene was frantically looking over the controls, searching for some way out of the situation, some magic button to save us. We couldn't drop the bomb. It had to be carefully deployed with the arm on our craft, and blowing it up before we made it at least 2,000 metres away would surely end in us getting caught in the explosion. So instead, we sat and waited to die. We couldn't see it. We didn't have a viewpoint at the back of the HOV, but we could hear it. Its long body moving the water aside, back and forth and slow, long motions. Harry held the stick, powering us forward, but the rest of us were staring at the depth gauge as it slowly ticked up and up. 7,200 meters, 7,150, 7,100. We kept climbing, waiting for our ship to come to a stop, waiting for it to grab our engine and tear us to shreds. But as we got higher and higher, we started to breathe and started to calm down somewhat. After a while, we couldn't hear it anymore. Couldn't feel the waves it caused under the water, pushing us back and forth. And for a brief moment, we felt we could relax. That is, until we saw the surface. From the light coming down through the water, we could see dozens of fish, all drifting off, floating weirdly, and we knew, we knew it was the worms. We may have survived, but we also failed, and whatever that was, it was only going to get worse. I'm back on land now, back in my home, sitting at my desk. I don't have a happy ending for you. Those things are still out there, and we couldn't stop them. Hopefully, the NOAA has a plan. Because the ocean isn't safe anymore. Please, stay out of the water. Sat at her side, I watched the heart monitor pulse weaker and weaker as my mother's life faded, her final sigh coming to an end as she breathed her last. Tears rolled down my cheeks and I squeezed her hand one final time. My body was numb, my mind fogged with memories of her life, taking me and my siblings to Six Flags, eyes betraying her smile as she watched our reactions in the rearview mirror when we realised where we were going. How she hugged me when she finally got custody from dad and I got to see her for the first time in months. Welcoming me and my friends inside with hot chocolate after a long play in the snow. Telling us to leave our boots outside. I broke down. The feeling of loss that had been building from the moment she collapsed from a stroke a week ago. Finally escaping the vault of my soul. My hand pressed against my temple as the pain began to build there. My vision going blurry for a moment. 
Where am I? Where's mom? I asked, head swiveling around, surveying the restaurants I was in as my headache continued to bloom and spread. What are you talking about? Charlotte asked, reaching a hand out to squeeze mine. Are you okay? Maybe we should take you to the hospital. We were on our fourth date again. We'd just been bowling, and now we're at a restaurant. No, I'm okay. What were you saying? I asked, and she eyed me nervously, watching my face and biting her lip with concern, before deciding I must be okay. I was asking about the next few chapters of your book. It's been almost a month since I've heard anything from you, or seen any of your writing. We're getting nervous, Charlotte said, speaking in the voice of John, my publishing manager. I set the packet down on John's desk, eagerly watching him pick it up and flip through the pages. All right, I'll take a look at this, but please keep me updated. No more long silences. Her heart monitor was silent, and I stared down at her, squeezing her hand gently, rubbing my thumb in circles on her wrinkled, dry skin. Something felt wrong. She was my mother. She had died just before my eyes. Didn't I cry? Or shouldn't I? I thought I had cried, but now I felt no tears. My hands shot to my forehead, pressing against my temples and rubbing as the headache came back in pulsing, pounding waves. I let out a groan of agony and felt a hand on my cheek. Unlike my mother's, this hand was soft and warm and it lifted my head to face her. You don't look so good. We should get you some help. Charlotte's innocent hazel eyes, resting just below walnut brown bangs, started into mine with sincerity. And for a moment I smiled, but that quickly fell away, as I wondered why she was touching me, being so kind. I had loved her once, hadn't I? Now she sat here before me, during our best date, and I felt bored, disinterested. The slam of the packet hitting the desk ripped me from my thoughts. This is sick. The story is too dark. How are we supposed to sell this? Who would read something like this? John was angry, I think. I couldn't focus on his words. I was too distracted, thinking about how much this had hurt me once before. You need to rewrite these chapters, or this book isn't going to make the shelves. Rewrite them? I had before, but now I couldn't be bothered to try. Whatever had driven me to write the book before was gone. Jesus, you don't even care, do you? You need help. What? Do you need help? The nurse asked, placing a hand on my shoulder as I stood looking down at the woman in the bed. She was pale. Freckles dotting her face like embers coming from her fire-red hair, just like mine. She seemed so familiar. Must have seen her somewhere before. Maybe at the coffee shop I worked at, or someone I'd seen passing on the street. Who was she? I asked, and the nurse's brow wrinkled with concern. She's your mother. Are you feeling okay? You need help. I do. You need help. You need help. You need help. Help me! I cried out the cold tree barking against my back, digging into my skin and tearing my shirt, leaving long scratches down my body. My hands gripped the wrist of the appendage that held my throat, and my legs swung and kicked at its black bony torso, but the thing didn't budge. I could only see out of my left eye. My right had been pushed down into its socket by the long tube that forced its way past into my skull. I choked on my words, trying to cry for help again, as its claws dug into my skin. I know you put a lot of work into this book, but we can't justify working with you anymore. Your initial idea was very good, but you fumbled the delivery, and it just makes sense to stick to our better prospects. I'm sorry, but we have to let you go, John said firmly from behind his desk. The first time he'd said this, I begged, humiliated myself further and groveled, making promises and offering to take lower royalties for another chance. But now, I couldn't even remember what the book was about, or why I cared so much about it to begin with. John spoke up again from behind his desk, a little different now, his voice almost sinister. It was a pleasure to meet you. I felt its long, worm-like tongue slither past my eye, causing it to roll down and out of my alignment as the thing pulled on my skin and brain, bile rising into my throat from the sick sensation. The thing took a step back, and I fell to the floor as it released my bleeding neck and dropped onto all fours. It was covered in thick black fur with grey speckles down its side. The fur on its spine stood up straighter and longer than the rest, 
and its four limbs all had four digits that looked perfect for gripping its prey. Gripping me. Behind it swung a long furry tail, the end a tuft of grey hair. Its face was hairless, a long narrow skull covered in wrinkly pink skin that ended in a short trunk where its tongue retracted into. Its beady black eyes stared at me for a few moments before it walked past, vanishing into the woods. My hand rose to feel my right eye, now crooked and pointing lower than the other, a gap above it where the tongue had slid past, oozing blood. I sighed and stood up, walking away. I don't know what it did to me, but it took something. My mind is a foggy mess, and I can hardly remember my own name. I thought writing this might help, help me feel something again, or straighten out my memories, but it hasn't. I guess I'll post this. Maybe it'll help one of you. Stay out of the woods.